thank you very much. Well, good evening, everybody. God bless you tonight. I hope you got your pens and papers because we have lots of information to share with you. Uh, special greeting to Pastor Norman. Thank you very much, brother. Uh, Pastor Ruth and all those in the fellowship of this church for another opportunity. It was a good time last time. We're going to have a good time this time. Uh, on September the 11th last year, most of you remember it would have been the 12th in my country, New Zealand, probably about halfway there. What time was it over here when all that happened? Okay. Uh, on the 11th, was it? Oh, it was in the morning, early in the morning in New Zealand. And uh, uh, when I saw that happen, I said to my wife, I've got to uh, accept the invitation to go back to America again. I wasn't going to go again uh, because we have other countries we're interested in. Kill that cell phone, somebody, please. And... Um, so I did. I accepted an invitation from the Prophecy Club in America and traveled through a number of cities, went through in about two and a half weeks, 7,000 miles by motor car. That's a long trip, you'll agree. So I had a young fellow driving me. His name was Michael. When he got tired, I drove. And when I got tired, he drove. We just kept going. After a meeting, we'd leave at 11 o'clock at night, pack the van and drive 1,000 miles to the next meeting. We were right across America, right down to the bottom of New Orleans, went through towns like Portland, Oregon, Spokane, Washington, Denver, Colorado, Kansas City, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Lansing, Missouri, Detroit, South Bend, Indiana, Cleveland, Ohio, Lancaster, Baltimore, which is over by Washington, D.C., and then down to New Orleans and finished up down there and got myself a tie. <laughs> okay, so that happened in uh, last... Uh, just recently, and the, the information I have with you is right up to date, I promise you. So God bless everybody. People say, how did you start doing what you're doing? It's, uh, I was born again in 1953. Some of you know my story. Through a train smash in New Zealand. There was a train leaving Wellington. And I have an article here from the newspaper. Look at this train's tragedy, 30th anniversary. That was 1983 in the newspaper. It's now 49 years ago. That train shot into the river. My best friend was sitting in the front carriage. His name was Alan. He was killed outright. They found him with a gash on the front of his head where he'd hit the seat in front. And I ran down to the garage that day. As soon as I heard the news, early in the morning, my father told me. So I went down the garage and I prayed the sinner's prayer and I became a Christian, a born-again believer. Everybody needs to be born again. If you're not, this is the prayer you pray. At the end of the service, I will give an invitation. It goes like this. Lord Jesus, I come to the cross where you died for me. Number one, I repent because I'm a sinner, you see. So all sinners need to repent. I'm sorry, I turn away from my sin, and I turn to Jesus. Number two, I believe the Bible is true when it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. Your blood is enough for me, Lord Jesus, and I accept that, and I was blessed by being saved by the grace of God. Number three, I open the door to my life and receive Christ. Bible promise to as many as receive Him. To them gave He power to become the sons of God. In 1953, Christmas time, Barry Smith got saved, born again by the power of God. And that's why it is a great joy tonight to have a chance, Brother Norm, to preach in this church and to uh, share the information with you and bring the antidote to the problem. The antidote is receive Christ and be thoroughly born again. At the end of this meeting, I will give an invitation for you to get out of your seats. If you have never received Christ, you will stand here, right here, in front of all these people and you will give your life to the Lord and he will change you by his mighty power. Good news? Yeah. So tonight we're going to move on. Um, <clears throat> anybody who's interested in the books and tapes will be interested to know in the year 1972 I went to the Cook Islands, an island called Rarotonga. Is there anybody here tonight from the Cooks? Any Cook Islanders? And that's up by Tahiti and I was on my knees in a little uh, valley called the Takawa'ine Valley which means my wife's valley. And as I prayed that afternoon, I said, Lord, I want to reach Australia and New Zealand with the message you have given me. We had been missionaries around the Pacific for many years, uh, from 1960 to 72, 12 years. Now, how do you reach New Zealand and Australia? It's not easy. I can't advertise in the newspaper, my name is Smith, here I come, you lucky people. <laughs> Who's going to come and listen to you? With a name like Smith, you're doomed before you start. <laughs> Someone said there's a smith behind every bush. <laughs> and so I was on my knees up this little valley in, Tukawa, in the Takawa'ine Valley, Rarotonga, in the year 1953. 
and uh, 73, I'm sorry. And the Spirit of God fell upon me. I had in front of me a living Bible, and I opened it, and I read from Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And I want to show you what I, Can I have a... We need someone fit to run across there, brother. Are you a fit man? Thank you. God bless you. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, and this is what I read from the Living Bible. If you um, can see that tonight, I'd like you to read it with me, if you would, please. Let's read it. And the Lord said unto me, Write my answer on a billboard, large and clear, so that anyone can read it at a glance and rush to tell the others. But these things I plan won't happen right away. Slowly, steadily, surely, the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. If it seems slow, do not despair, for these things will surely come to pass. Just be patient, they will not be overdue a single day. And so I was paralyzed under the power of God. It's never happened before or after. It was a supernatural experience. And whereas others get into Bible prophecy because they are interested in it, I became a, a speaker on Bible prophecy because I was commissioned to do it. It was a supernatural thing. And uh, thank God, he said, it'll take time, slowly, steadily, surely. So I put on the board here tonight, uh, 90, put up 2002, and we're, this was about 1973. So you can see many years later, uh, the thing is being fulfilled. I was in my office the other day. I took a piece of paper and I wrote, it's all happening. Well, it, had, it is, you know. And, and we go around airports all around the world and people meet me. They say, you Barry Smith? Yes. You know, I heard you 25 years ago and I laughed at you. I'm not laughing now. <laughs> They've stopped laughing, everybody. Do you know, we were in South Africa not long ago, at the end of last year. You know, it's the most violent city, Johannesburg. And I, when I was there, I heard about a, a couple who were in bed having a sleep. And while they were in bed, they heard a rustling noise. It was a burglar coming in the window. And when the burglar came inside, they were wide awake, of course. They looked at him, and he said, I'm sorry you woke up, because I'll have to kill you now. He said, because you can identify me. So before I do, he said to the girl, what's your name? She said, Elizabeth. He said, oh, no, that's my mother's name. He said, I can't kill you. So he said to the man, what's your name? He said, Peter, but all my friends call me Elizabeth. So what we did was, thank you, we came home, and if you'd like to get some of the books and tapes and stuff, if, you, if we haven't got them here tonight, we've got a lot with us, but if we haven't got them, anybody who's on the net, would you please write down the website, if you don't mind? Here we go. There it is, www.amigatimes.com, there it is there, and we can give you information on, on books and tapes and so on. We'd like to point out that we have the books on the table. I got back to New Zealand. They said, what does it mean? I said, it means I have to write some books so people can read the things that God has shown me. So I wrote seven books. This one is called Warning, written in 1978, full of information about the common market, which is coming to power, of course, this year. You'll know they've got a common currency called the euro, which affects 300 million people, more than the population of the United States, which means that the United States, with the twin towers going down, will now move, of course, the economic system from America to Europe under the power of a man called Antichrist. That's where we are. So that's a good book. I read it myself the other day. <laughs> when, you read it, when you've read everything on the plane, you read your own. You get desperate. <laughs> the next one I wrote, second warning. This has information on, on occult, the Antichrist, the false prophet. That's an excellent book for soul winning. Many, many people have received Christ through that. I remember one night, Norm, going through a little town called Tamworth. You've heard of that one? Yeah. Tam is in New South Wales. Yeah. And as we stopped at the traffic lights in the old truck, we used to drive a truck around Australia. And a, a, a fellow put his head in the window. He said, are you Barry Smith? I said, yes. He said, I received Christ through reading that book, Second Warning. So I said, which part interested you? He said, I'm a scientist. And he said, the part that interested me, he said, uh, pointed out that when proton A on one side of the universe is affected, Proton B on the other side of the universe is also affected. I realized there must be a God, so I gave my life to Jesus. <laughs> and I thought, goodness, out of all the stuff I put in my book, a fellow got saved, huh? <laughs> 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 this, 
This one here, this one here, 400 pages of information called Final Notice. I got that name from the electricity department. <laughs> the, the stuff in there about the, the global warming scam, you all about ozone, all that sort of thing, it's all in there. The, uh, the AIDS problem, the AIDS, that AIDS was created in a laboratory in America, it's now been proven. Did you know that there is a man suing the American government because they knew that the AIDS virus was created in America in a laboratory. And the cure is out. There is a cure for AIDS. It's called ozone. Ozone, which is O3 and also O4, polyatomic oxygen. We have people working in Africa curing AIDS using polyatomic oxygen. You break it up into its various parts, O3, O4, O8, and then inject it straight into the blood system. And within about seven treatments like that, things really happen. Ultimately, you are declared undetectable, in HIV undetectable. So uh, people need to get to hear about this. The pharmaceutical people hate it and will try and stop it because it's going to ruin their trade. But the breath of God, ozone, that's the cure. Praise God. It's all in there. Final notice. And also about the IMF, the World Bank, the Bank for International Settlements. All that stuff is in there. Very good book. Next one. Uh, what do you write after you've written final notice? P.S., of course. P.S. has got all the... Uh, how many degrees are there in Freemasonry? Everybody calls out 33. Same in America. Actually, there are over 97. Over 97 degrees. They're all in here, and it explains a lot in there. That's very fascinating indeed. Also, this book here, um, Better Than Nostradamus, you'll find 25 reasons why America is mentioned in the Bible and prophecies. And that book there wins masses of people to Christ better than Nostradamus. It'll show a picture of a Freemason dressed ready for his... Um, for his introduction to the lodge and so on. It'll show you all the stuff on the American dollar we're going to talk about tonight. It's all in here. And then after you've got that one, you get this one, the devil's jigsaw. And in there is the picture of the Twin Towers, which we put in three and a half years before it happened. If you have a look at it, you'll see it on the blow up here. I'm being interviewed by newspapers all over the world now. The Japanese television people came to New Zealand the other day to see me. They said, how did you know this? There's the Twin Towers, the aeroplane, anthrax in the sky there. This was three and a half years before. And also, also you'll find down there on the page opposite the words crop dusters. And on the next page you'll see a statement by a man called Louis Farrakhan. He says, you can quote me, America will be destroyed at the hand of the Muslims. That's five things in that book. So that book is winning a lot of souls. And then the next one I wrote, here it is, I spy with my little eye. All the countries that are following New Zealand proving the point that we are into a world government plan. New Zealand was the test case, and Australia is following quickly behind. But the good news is, Jesus is coming. Amen. That's what we're talking about. So, also, I've got some tapes. To, I'd like to highly recommend these music tapes, if, if you're into music. My son Andrew and his wife Saskia, who a little Dutch girl from Sydney. Some of you know them. They're singing. They have a new one out now. It's called Now and Then. And then the Gem Cutter. This is excellent music. And God will bless you if you're interested in those. Um, also, we have these on video. We've got videos of all the meetings that we take, subjects galore, and these win souls because they're all done in our studio in New Zealand. Where they work on them there, put the Bible verses in, and prove the point. Very, very well done, I promise, if you're interested, purchase those. Anybody who's interested in uh, getting the Omega Times, we put this out every month. No matter where in the world I am, I do 16 articles each month for the paper. And if you'd like to subscribe to it, get a subscription form, fill it in, and uh, we will send it to you every month. God bless you for that. Also, the banner. There's the banner over there. Be careful when you turn, you might put your neck out. <laughs> oh, I mean that. You can do it if you do it suddenly. Most people purchase two of those, one one way, one the other, and keep a record of the coming of the Lord. So God bless you, everybody. We're into it, and there's lots and lots of info. Here we go. One last thing. If you want to come to Israel with us, who's interested? <laughs> What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? I thought you were tough Aussies. <laughs> this will be trip number 19 this year. Trip number 19, if you want to join us on the Israel trip, take one of these. We'd love you to come with us. And if it's looking a little bit dangerous, we won't be going. But if it's all right, we're going. You must understand that, that when the media go there, they only photograph the problems. The, the, the Jewish people are still living there. They're buying and selling and eating and everything. It's okay. <laughs> and I said, Lord, I, I told the Lord I want to be there when the peace treaty is signed. 
I've been 18 times looking for it. <laughs> this could be it this year. So you take one of those brochures and by faith you go ahead and join us. You'll enjoy this one, I promise you. And if it's looking a bit dicky, we won't go. We'll just postpone it and go a little bit later. You'll walk where Jesus walked. You'll see all these things. Very exciting. So praise God, everybody. Have you been yet, Mom? You better come on this one, bro. <laughs> you take an offering up for your pastor. He's got to go. Ruth, you been there? All right, you, you need to come. Love to have you with us on the trip. Okay, here we go then. Now, the, we're going to read tonight in the book of Matthew 24. Some of you have noticed that something strange is happening in the country. Will you agree that Australia is not the country it used to be? Yeah. Something's gone wrong. And so we're going to read in Matthew 24. And we'll see that what's happening in the world today are birth pangs for the birth of the kingdom of God on earth. Jesus is coming back, and we need to recognize that. Now, before I get on to this message, a special thanks tonight to, to the artist who drew that picture outside there. That's fantastic. Kevin, where's Kevin Goldworthy? Can someone see him? There he is over there. Brother, that was magnificent. And I want to say that you've got more... You give him a clap. When you drew that picture of me, there are more teeth in my head than I've actually got. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> now we're going to read a verse in Matthew 24, verse 34, the words of Jesus. Here we go. Jesus speaking, King James readers, read with me please. Where are you? Wave your hands, King James readers. You're called the remnant, you read with me. <laughs> Matthew 24, 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. The question has been asked, what is the meaning of the words this generation? And many people believe that the generation started in 1948. And, and you remember in 1948, four things happened. And you'll have a look at them on the screen here. I think I'd better make a little passageway through here if I can. So I can see what I'm doing. In 1948, four things happened, which gave a lot of people the impression that the, the generation Jesus spoke of started in that year. First of all, the founding of the European community. In 1948, three nations signed up, the Benny Lux Agreement, and you're allowed to call out in these meetings if you would please. BE stands for? NE stands for? And LUX stands for? In 1948, the Benny Lux Agreement was signed between those three, and that is the final world empire. Everybody understand at the moment when I speak to you tonight on the, what are we up to? What's the date today? What's the date? On the 15th of May in the year 2002, the common market now has 15 nations and there are 13 more applying to join and that'll make 28 and Tony Blair is saying they will have a two-tier community, T-I-E-R. The inner tier will be made up of 10 that will go for full political and monetary union and the beginnings of that thing were 1948. In, in 1948, Israel became a nation. Who can give me the month of the year? May, which date? The 14th, two sevens of 14, the multiple of God's number of perfection. Israel became a nation. The fig tree blossomed, according to Matthew 24. And Jesus said, when you see these things happening, it is near you, even at the doors. Number three, the great World Council of Churches had their first meeting in 1948. In the book of Revelation, chapter 17, we read there of a harlot or a prostitute system, which is a religious system which does not believe in being born again, but believes in linking all religions together. At the meetings of the World Council of Churches, they have had Anglicans, Presbyterians, Methodists, Associated Churches of Christ, Congregationals, also present as observers. They have had Roman Catholics, Buddhists, Sikhs, Muslims, Hindus, the Church of Satan will not be exempt and the New Age movement will play a prominent part. It's a great world church, the very opposite to the Bride of Christ and Jesus is coming back again for a bride. Amen. The Bible says we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb and if you look up there we go up to be with Jesus, we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Those of you who can see up into the darkness there see it? And that banner by the way, do you like my banner? That was done in South Africa. I got off the plane one day in Johannesburg Airport. A lady came up to me. She said, are you Barry Smith? I said, yes. She said, I got born again by watching your video. Is there anything I can do for you? I said, there is a small job I'd like done. <laughs> she was an artist. I learned she was an artist. 
She went home and bought the material. She was up for four or five days. She worked day and night. And I, I wrote it all on a piece of cardboard, borrowed from behind one of the airline counters. I just wrote all the stuff on cardboard off the top of my head. She went home and did that and brought it back to the airport on the last day. We unrolled it right across the airport and all the other passengers came to have a look at it. And when they saw what it was, they all ran away. <laughs> I said to the lady, when you do it, make a nice long marriage supper table. Would you have a look at that table? You'll see Jesus is the heavenly bridegroom. There's a big long table. There's room for all of us here in this meeting. I believe there are a few spare seats just over here. Look. <laughs> and uh, welcome to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We must be born again. We must be ready. We must be watching and we must be clean, ready for the wedding supper. Then Jesus comes back again and will reign in power forever and forever and forever. Anybody who is born again will understand the difference between religion and being born again. A lot of you have been to church for years, never got saved. No point in that. And I want to say to all of you tonight, if you're not going to be born again, have a good time. I really mean that. Imagine having been to church all your life and then going to hell. All you've got to think about is sitting in church. How boring. For goodness sake, think about it, Keith. We must have an experience of Christ. It's not a religion, it's a relationship. And so we see point number four is, in 1948, in North Battleford, Canada, there was a great movement of God's Spirit. And we saw there, all these students got up and worshipped God day and night. They couldn't send them to bed. 1948 it was. And they said, no, no, the power of God is on us. That great burst of praise spread around the world. It's got as far down as New Zealand. It's back to Australia. It's even in Pensehurst tonight. And it put life back into the church. Some of you will know that church without the Holy Spirit is very boring. Who agrees with that? I had a guy years ago, we were preaching for Frank Houston in town there, and uh, this air airline pilot who used to fly international came to the meeting in Goldburn Street, received Christ, then he took the tapes back to the uh, king what's it called, the airport at Sydney, and he was playing them in the pilot's room. Another guy called John walked in and he says, what's this rubbish? And the other guy said, listen, he said, this is a man talking about biblical events and prophecy, and it's very good stuff. If you like it, sit down and listen, otherwise shut up and go away. <laughs> That's a clear word. The fellow sat down and listened, and nine hours later he said, is there any more? <laughs> and the very next week he came out and when I gave the invitation, he was out the front giving his life to Christ. And he said, as a young man, he went to Nelson College in New Zealand. They were trained to go to church. He said, it was so boring. I saw the crosses. I smelt the incense. I looked and I saw goblets. He said, when I walked into this meeting at Goldburn Street, he said, I noticed there were no goblets. I said, I could write a book called that, No Goblets. I like it. He said there was friendly looking people, happy people, and the singing was good. And he said that influenced me to give my life to Jesus. Amen. Some of you people, all you've known is goblets. We need more than that. We need to have an experience of Christ and get our hearts changed. And then we enjoy the book. So God bless you, everybody. Those are the four things. Now, the point is this. If that's true, that 1948 is the beginning of the generation, how long did Moses wander in the desert? 40 years, that's the length of a generation. That brings us to 1988, and one enthusiastic American author wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Must Return in 1988. That book is not selling very well at the moment. <laughs> and so we had to look again, <laughs> and listen to this from a man who's been to Israel 18 times. I want to tell you something. When I was a young fellow, they told me that Israel was God's clock. And if you look up there, you'll see where I'm pointing. You'll see a clock up there. It's pointing to two minutes to 12. I want to say tonight with authority, Israel is not God's clock. Jerusalem is God's clock. And I want you to turn with me to an Old Testament scripture in the book of Zechariah. We're now turning back to Zechariah. You say, how do you find Zechariah? Start at the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi. Go back one book and you're in Zechariah. That was easy. One man said, happiness is finding Zechariah before the minister has finished preaching from it. <laughs> We're now reading from Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 3. Read with me, please. Let's read it. All together, King James readers. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. 
Who wants Jerusalem, you know? Israel says it is their eternal capital. The Palestine Liberation Organization under Yasser Arafat wants Jerusalem. They want all of it. Uh, the Orthodox Church wants Jerusalem. The Roman Catholic Church wants Jerusalem. The Freemasons want Jerusalem. Did you know that the Freemasons have a lodge under the wall of Jerusalem? And when you come out the city from the Damascus Gate facing the Garden Tomb, you look to the right and you go up to a cave called Zedekiah's Cave, and that is where the lodge is under there. And these men set up the lodge about the time Yikshak Rabin was killed, just before that. And their aim is to build Solomon's Temple. It's part of their folklore, you know, that they teach in Freemasonry. So they have a real interest in the city of Jerusalem. But I want to tell you who's, who it really belongs to. It belongs to God. Amen. He said, it's mine. And he'll give it to who he wants to give it to. He's given it to Israel, but also he has plans for the Arab nations in the last days as well. So God will sort the whole thing out. Praise God for that. Amen. So please hear that, everybody. In the book of Isaiah, it speaks about Assyria, it speaks about Egypt, and it speaks about Israel being a third in the midst of the land, and God is going to bless those three areas right through the Middle East there when Jesus comes back. Praise God. That's good news. So in the meantime, they fight each other. Now, now all right, now in 1967, something happened. Some of you remember 1967, there was a six-day war. And some of you older people were alive in those days. Which of you were not here, please? Where were you in 67? Where were you? You weren't born. Disgusting. <laughs> All the old people remember it. 1967, there was a six-day war. Do you remember? How long did the war last? Six days. And I want you to notice that at, and when the war finished, 40 million who came against Israel were beaten. And the whole city of Jerusalem went back into Israeli hands for the first time in 2,500 years. The flag flew. And that means that when Sharon went up on the Temple Mount, he had every right to do so because actually Israel does own Jerusalem at this moment. And I want you to understand that there is a prophecy given there in Luke 21, 24b. And the man who's speaking to you, I want to say this tonight, I have uh, Arab friends, I have Israeli friends, I'm friends because God loves the world. But he's just said that this is the way he wants it to happen, that Israel must have control of that city at the end of a certain period. Luke 21, 24b says this, And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. What is a Gentile, please? A non-Jew. Good. What is a Jew? Don't say a non-Gentile. I know that. <laughs> What's a Jew, somebody, please? You've got a, a, man with, a man or a woman with a Jewish mother. You take the nationality of the mother. Every other nation takes the nationality of the father. Look at the wisdom of God. When his son Jesus was born, he was born into the only nation that takes the nationality of the mother. Therefore, through Mary, he's connected to the earth. Through God, his heavenly father, he's connected to heaven. And when he hung on the cross with one hand, he reaches out to sinners like you and me, reaches out with the other hand to Almighty God, brings us together through his death on the cross. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Jesus is the one who brings us to God. And if we, anybody who's in heaven will be there because of Jesus Christ. And so we see there that the times of the Gentiles ran out in 1967. It's over. All of you tonight who do not have a Jewish mother, our time period is over. However, there is another short period also given to us in the book of Romans chapter 11, and verse 25. Let's read that, please. We're now reading Romans 11:25. Someone said, why do you say it twice? Because they don't hear me the first time. And they bump their neighbors and say, what did he say? What did he say? So I say it twice. Romans 11:25. Let's read it, shall we? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. The times of the Gentiles finished in 1967, but the fullness of the Gentiles is still in operation. And when the last Gentile gives his life to Jesus, then Jesus comes back again, and that is the finish of the Gentiles' opportunity. He then moves with Israel again. Blindness comes off them, and they will recognize that Jesus is their Messiah. It's a very godless nation, everybody. I mean, 
I went up there expecting to see people wandering around in striped clothing, you know, like I see in the old Bible days. It's not like that at all. They have disco boats on the Sea of Galilee where Jesus used to walk. And I'm trying to have a meeting on the, on the lawn in front of the Sea of Galilee there at the hotel. And you can hear this boom, boom, boom as the disco boat goes past. It's very un unspiritual. This is on the Sabbath, mind you. The Sabbath is a Friday night to Saturday night sunset, and these guys are out doing a disco on the middle of the lake there on a boat. So godless. And that's why they've got to take the veil off the Jews. And when our opportunity is finished, the veil comes off, and God goes back to Israel. They recognize Jesus as their Messiah, and they will become a powerhouse, preaching the everlasting gospel in the last days. Good news, everybody. Now, that being the case, you say, all right, where are we up to now? Many years ago, there was a man... Oh, sorry, before we do that, bro, sorry. We do a simple sum here. 1967 plus 40, that's the length of time Moses wanted in the desert, brings us to? 2007. It would appear that because we are living in the generation Jesus spoke of, let's say the verse again, Matthew 24, 34. It says, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. In other words, everything's got to happen within the space of a generation. I can prove to you from a, a scripture, maybe later in the series, from Daniel chapter 8, that 1967 was the date, the start of the generation. Fascinating. Now, that being the case, do you realize we're living in the generation? In the year 1950, uh, excuse me, my mind going, going, 1963, we were living in Samoa. My wife's from the island, and when we were there, we had an outpouring of God's Spirit. A little fellow got up and prophesied that night and spoke like this. He said, My children, I say unto you, many of you will not die, but you will see me coming in the clouds with great glory. Amen. This was the 1960s. I'm saying tonight there are people here who will never see death. You'll go alive into heaven. Jesus is coming in the space of a generation. I want to say this also. Don't you go home and say, Barry Smith said Jesus is coming in 2007. <laughs> you, you wreck my ministry. Don't you do that to me. Because I'm saying all these dates are approximations. That's the key word, approximations. Once you set a firm date and it doesn't happen, you might as well stay at home. Your ministry is finished. I'm saying that we don't know whose calendar we're using, whether the Jewish or the Gentile calendar, which one, but we know we're living at the end of a generation. And all the prophecies are happening. So by approximately 2007, everything should be fulfilled and we get ready now for the coming of Christ. Now, many years ago, there was a man called the Apostle Paul. He was called the Apostle to the Gentiles, and he was given a number of mysteries. Do you remember? He was carried up into heaven, into paradise, and while he was there, he saw these mysteries. I'd like you to call them out with me, please. There were nine of them. Okay, here we go. The first one, the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of? 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 And this one, the mystery of iniquity, we're going to speak about that tonight. Next one, the mystery of? And the mystery of the? Now those nine mysteries were given to Paul in heaven. I've got a new book out called the Unveiling the Ultimate Secret, which is the mystery of the gospel. Did I do that last time I was here? I think I might have, did I? Do you remember those steps I did? Remember? You mean to say you've forgotten that magnificent message? <laughs> And you remember, remember that Paul got his message from Jesus in heaven. Peter got his message from Jesus on earth. There was a difference. The gospel of the kingdom, Peter. The gospel of the grace of God, Paul, which is the greatest revelation ever. We get saved by the blood of Jesus. Under the gospel of Peter, it was the water that, that, was the, that washed away the sin. Remember that? Be baptized for the remission of sins. Now we read, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. It is no longer the water, but it's the blood. Now recognize this, that the mystery of iniquity is our subject tonight. And you say, what do you know about the mystery of iniquity? Quite a bit, actually. And we're going to read a verse from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, speaking of a great world leader who was getting ready to arise. He's called Antichrist. He's called the beast. He's called the man of sin. And later on in his ministry, he is called by the title Son of Perdition, which was applied to another man in Bible history whose name was Judas Iscariot. The man dies, but the devil lives on. And as I speak to you tonight on the 15th of May, is it? 15th of May. Um, the Antichrist is alive on earth, everybody. 
He's not a schoolboy. He's a, he's a man. He's into politics. He's into uh, diplomacy. He's into economy. He's a peacemaker. He's a very powerful man. He will be a non-religious Jew. You say, where'd you get that from? Two verses. If you're taking notes, write them down, please. First one, John 5, 43. Jesus speaking. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. Another will come in his own name, and him you will receive. They missed the real one, they'll get the false one. Was Jesus a Jew according to the flesh? Yes. In the book of Hebrews it says he sprang from the tribe of Judah. Therefore it is no use a red Indian turning up and saying to the Jews, I am your Messiah. <laughs> they'll say, back to your wigwam. You know? <laughs> There is another verse which goes with it. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 37. Listen to this one. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. This will show his non-religious nature. The God of his fathers is Yahweh. That's how the Jewish people spell Yahweh. You leave out the vowels because if you put them in, you blaspheme against God. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, says Daniel 11, 37. And then in the King James Bible, it says, nor the desire of women. It looks as if he is a sexual weirdo, but that is not what the Bible is saying. If you look at the second portion in the Amplified Bible, which is more correct from the original Greek language, it says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor him to whom women desire to give birth. Now that looks like a Welsh signpost. <laughs> but it is not a Welsh signpost, it means this. This Antichrist man, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, Yahweh, his parents obviously still go to the synagogue, nor him to whom women desire to give birth. Who did every Jewish girl want to give birth to? Answer, the Messiah, whom we now know to be Jesus. Therefore, this man will be a non-religious Jew, and he will be arrogant. There's, there's a whole lot of stuff about him in my book, warning there, information about this man, a big mouth, boaster, and he's alive today. And I want you to understand, this man will appear shortly. He will do three jobs. Write down the three jobs he will do, please. Number one, he will be appointed shortly leader of the European community. Already we have 15 countries in it. They're looking for a leader. They, they, in fact, they're looking for a president right now. Did you know that? They're looking for a president. Henry Kissinger said some time ago, the common market is powerful, but not powerful enough because there is nobody who can speak with the same authority as the President of the United States. He said, we need a President of the European Union. They're going to get one shortly. Your verse for that is Revelation chapter 17, verses 10 to 12. Next, this man will confirm a peace treaty in the Middle East shortly between the Jews and the Arabs. They're getting sick of it over there. They're sick of fighting. Both sides are sick of it. There are peace activists everywhere that are fed up. And I want you to understand that it's not that the people are against each other. There are powers behind all this. The average person hates it. The Jews and the Arabs can live together quite happily apart from these rascals who are stirring the whole thing up. But ultimately, there will be a non-religious Jewish man, the Antichrist, will confirm a peace treaty for seven years with this people. And the verse is Daniel 9, 27. And that's why I want to keep going each year. I'd love to be there when it happens. Daniel 9, 27, he will break it after three and a half years. And the good news is, Noah was saved before the flood. Lot was saved before the fire. The believers will be saved before the tribulation. Amen. That's good news. It's, it, it's called Midrash teaching. It's happened before, it'll happen again. God never does something in the future that he hasn't done in the past. E.g., in the Old Testament, you had a great king of Babylon who made the people bow down and worship a statue. What was his name? Nebuchadnezzar. In the New Testament, there's a man called Antichrist who will make people bow down to worship something called the abomination of desolation. It'll be another statue. In the Old Testament, there was a man who was sold by his brethren for 30 pieces of silver. Who was he? Joseph. In the New Testament, another man sold by his brethren for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus. You see, these are Midrash pictures. So what I'm saying tonight is that we are living at a time when all these things are being midrashically or in type or shadow repeating themselves for God never does anything but he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Amos chapter 3 verse 7. Now let's move quickly on. That being the case, we're now ready to look at the mystery of iniquity but we'll look at our verse first here. Let's read it. This is 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 7 speaking about the Antichrist. Altogether, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work 
Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Can I point out to you tonight the reason Australia is in a mess at the moment is because of this plan? It's the mystery of iniquity. It's found on the back of every American $1 bill. And when I preached in those 13 major cities in the month of September, October last year, I would say to them, have you seen these seals before? And they said, no. And I said, why? Bring it down a bit, dear, please. That's, that's why, altogether, we spend them, we don't read them. And I'll guarantee that you people don't know what's on your money either. Unless you're desperate for reading material, you do not normally read your banknotes. And the Americans are no exception to the rule. They do not know, generally speaking, these things are here. I mean, I went through Los Angeles Airport one night. I was just filling in time. I said to my wife, watch this. I took an American dollar to a young fellow behind the counter and I said, excuse me, what do these seals mean? And he looked at me and he said, I don't know, I asked my mate here. <laughs> he asked his friend, they said, oh, we think it's something to do with, with uh, peace. Thank you, I said. Absolutely wrong. <laughs> Nothing to do with peace at all. These two seals, uh, we'll put it up again, please. Go hide it. That's it. These two seals, are, the information on this is found in my book, Better Than Nostradamus, and they were designed in Bavaria in the year 1776 by a secret society called the Illuminati. The Illuminati means the bearers of the light. Someone says, well, where do you get that information? Answer, from the Encyclopedia Britannica. But don't look through a modern version of the encyclopedia because they have erased the information from it. It's too volatile, you see. So you've got to go back to an old one, 1962, volume 12, and there you find this information about the Illuminati. Started by a man called Adam Weishaupt. Now, Weishaupt was a Bavarian, and he was a Jesuit priest in the Catholic Church who defected and became a Luciferian. His aim was to put Lucifer on the throne of the world. Now, Weishaupt with his Illuminati group, which means the bearers of the light, was a very powerful secret society. I'll put his name here. And he said that anybody who belongs to his group had to have a secret name. Now, his secret name was Spartacus. You'll see the significance of that in just a moment. And so, this Illuminati crowd... Thank you. Keep water on again. This Illuminati crowd designed these two seals... And they were put on the back of the American dollar in the year 1933 by a man called President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was a 32nd degree Mason. Please understand that both of these seals are witchcraft seals. I like all this going on tape. I love it. It's going out and there's people getting saved left, right and centre because when you hear all this, you see it for the first time. Now watch carefully, please. When you examine the seals, you say, all right, what's the eye up there? Is that the eye of God? Of course not. Anybody who knows about God that we serve knows that he doesn't have one eye. Is that right? He's not a cyclops. <laughs> it says in the Bible, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect towards him. And thus we learn tonight the eye was originally called the eye of Horus in Egyptian mythology. And many times we go to Egypt on our Middle East tours. And as we go up the Nile River, on the river cruise, which is a good one, we stop off at temples and the guides there show me the eye of Horus in the temple. That's what it is. It is now called the eye of Lucifer, who was originally the bright and shining one, got thrown out of heaven, and now he is called Satan, the god of this world, the prince of this world, and the prince of the power of the air. That is the eye of Satan there. Anybody who is into psychic, um, anybody witchcraft, knows if you open your eye a little bit, you have psychic knowledge, and when you open your eye completely and it is illumined in a triangle like that, it is the eye of Lucifer, the bright and shining one, and he has that divine knowledge. Then there are 13 layers of stone. If you want to know what those represent, they are the 13 power groups in America in Freemasonry because America was founded by the Freemasons at the same time the Pilgrim Fathers settled it. There were two groups went there. You say, how do you know that? I was going to a meeting in Seattle one night, Washington, I saw a girl carrying a large book. I said, what's your book, dear? She says, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, written by a top Freemason called Manly Hall. I said, how much for your book? She said, $20. I paid her 20 American. I got the book. She got the money. And I took it all the way back to New Zealand. But when I turned to it, I found all the secrets in there that I needed to know. So the stuff you hear tonight is from top Freemasons who know exactly what they're talking about. This is what he says. 
He says, when America was settled, he said it was settled by a number of people, including Freemasons, not only the Pilgrim Fathers for religious freedom, that's why it says, in God we trust. You see, there's the Pilgrim Fathers, but at the same time, you've got the eye of Satan there. This is the Freemasons and occultists who settled America, if you're taking notes, for a peculiar and a particular purpose known only to the initiated few. Who are the initiated few in Freemasonry? They're called the adepts, the elect, and the sages. These men are the top men, above the 97th degree, and they are just under Lucifer in the pecking order. And you need to understand, this is a very powerful group, but Jesus is more powerful. Amen. Jesus said, all power is given unto me. And now and again you have meetings, you see all these witches and Satanists coming to my meetings and try and zap me. It's a complete waste of time. <laughs> Any Satanists and witches here tonight, you're wasting your time. Don't try. It'll probably jump back on you. I'm saying that. And so we see then that you've got the 13 layers of stone in, a, in American Freemasonry, which is the 13 major degrees. You'll find all those in my little book, P.S. I wonder if I should read them to you. Maybe it's better to do it, I think. Here they are. The page has actually fallen out. Here they go. First of all, down the bottom here is the Blue Lodge. When a man joins the Lodge, whether in Australia or America or England, he joins the Blue Lodge at the bottom. The three first degrees are the Blue Lodge degrees. First of all, they put a hoodwink over his eyes. He's hoodwinked uh, physically, and at the same time, he's hoodwinked spiritually. And while he's in that dreadful position, they roll up his shirt over his chest. They put a running noose around his neck. They prick him with the point of a sword. It is suggested to him that if he runs forward, he'll be stabbed by the sword, and if he runs backwards, he'll be hung by the running noose. While he's in that dreadful position, he draws his thumb across his throat, and he says, my throat will be cut from ear to ear if I divulge the secrets of this degree and my tongue torn out. He kisses the Bible once, sealing a witchcraft oath on the Word of God. Some of you know Freemasons, there may be some of you here tonight. You, you know that's true. I've had them shouting at me in a meeting. Shouting doesn't help. Everybody hear me, please. If the doctor says you've got cancer, it's no use shouting. You need to find a cure. And so, if he gets in the second degree, he draws his hand across his chest like a claw and says, my chest will be ripped open, my heart pulled out, and he kisses the Bible twice, sealing a witchcraft oath on the word of God. In the third degree, he draws his thumb like a knife across his stomach, says, my stomach will be ripped open, <coughs> my bowels pulled out. He gets three death blows to the head. He hears the secret name, Maha Bone. He falls into a sheet which has a coffin painted on it. He is carried around the lodge by fellow lodge members, viewing the skull and bones, death symbols. He then has a miraculous resurrection, akin to the resurrection of Jesus. I want to say tonight, that is blasphemy, for there is only one who rose from the dead of his own free will. Jesus Christ, he said, no man taketh my life from me, I lay it down of myself that I might take it again. No man has any right to do such a thing as have a resurrection like that. And then he kisses the Bible three times. Now what's the man done? He's put a curse on himself, his wife and his children to the third and the fourth generation. But there is one who breaks the curse. Amen. And the one I refer to as the biggest name on my chart over there, his name is Jesus. In the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Christ has been made a curse for us, for cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And any man who's been in the lodge needs to be delivered in the name of Jesus. They also teach you in the lodge that there are two gods, you see. They say, um, <clears throat> they say that Adonai is God, but Lucifer is also God. And then they reverse the roles. They make Lucifer the good side of God and Adonai the bad side of God. That is blasphemy. And that is why if you walk into a Masonic lodge, you'll see their floor is dualistic in nature. This is Eastern religion, you see. Eastern religion and philosophy speaks of a dualistic system. Where you have a male, you need a female to balance it, you see. Where you have good, you need evil. Where you have darkness, you have light. Where you have a Chinese yin, you have a Chinese yang. In the case of Almighty God, you have a problem because he doesn't have an opposite. It says God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. So what do these rascals do in the lodge? They make Lucifer the opposite side of God. They reverse the roles, and that is blasphemy. Look at the floor. If you go to any Masonic lodge, you'll see the floor looks like that. Black, white, black, white. You go to Canberra, I'll guarantee their, their floor of parliament looks like that. Every country connected with Great Britain as a colony. South, of, south of, um, what am I saying? South Africa, uh, Malaysia, Singapore... All India, all these countries will have those sort of flaws there. Why? Because Freemasonry dominates politics in the Western world today. 
Also, have you noticed the policemen's hats? It dominates the police system as well. Your, your, your police system is riddled with them. They've got their own law system, and that's why many rotten decisions are made, because if you've got a Masonic lodge, uh, a judge, and then you've got a Masonic lodge preacher, not the brought preacher, a victim, the victim's down there, all he's got to do is make a sign. And if the judge is up there, he sees the sign. Here's one of the signs. This one, wiping the sweat off your brow. Is there no pity for the widow's son? That's a sign to the judge the man belongs to the lodge. You must get him off. Here's another one, the great hailing sign of distress. If the prisoner goes like this and the judge is a mason, he must get that man off if he belongs to a certain degree in the lodge. That's the way it is. And I want to say tonight that Jack Straw in Great Britain put a stop to it. He said anybody who is in the lodge, who is in a position of power in the judiciary, the law system, must declare his membership of the lodge because there can be a conflict of interest between the two laws, the law of the country and the law of the lodge. One law is enough. Everybody... So you say, all right, well, say the guy's in the blue lodge, how far has he gone? Well, he's only gone to the first, first degree. And then he's gone to the second degree, and the third one, he's way down the bottom here, look. In the American lodges, he then moves up to the next one, the Scottish Rite or York Rite masonry. Above that, he goes to the shrine. Have you heard of the Shriners? They wear little red hats with tassels on them. They were originally Muslims who dipped their hats in the Christian's blood. That's where that comes from. The next one is the 33rd degree, which is away down here, Grand Sovereign Inspectors General. The, above that is the Order of the Trapezoid. Above that, Ancient and Primitive Rite, 97th degree. 97, mind you. A lot of these guys are running our country. Did you know that? A lot of politicians belong to it. Judges, lawyers, policemen, school teachers, professional people, doctors and dentists and so on. Over here, the next one is the Palladium. That's an evil one, I tell you. The next one above that is the Illuminati. The next one, the nine unknown men. Above that, the seven. Above that, the great architect of the universe. And at the top, Lucifer himself. And I give thanks to God that there is power in the blood of Jesus to set a man free from that. Anybody heard of a man called Joseph Smith? No relation of mine, I should tell you that. I need to make it clear. Did you know that Joseph Smith was a Freemason? And if you go through the temple at Carlingford, there's a Mormon temple up there, you will go through the cutting of the throat, the ripping of the chest, and the cutting of the stomach, and the Mormons will teach you that Jesus is a brother of, of, uh, of uh, Lucifer. That's Mormon teaching. I had a girl shouting at me in Dunedin one night uh, when I said that she was sitting in the front. I said, don't you shout at me. How dare you? I said, he said you learn what the t church teaches before you join it. Otherwise, don't join it. Who agrees with that? Find out what the church teaches before you join it, for goodness sake. Poor girl sitting there in ignorance. <laughs> so, <laughs> there we go. So we move quickly on then, and we find then that the Illuminati was the, was the power group behind the whole deal. Now, as we move further on with our study, we find with the American dollar, the two seals have, the seals have, have meanings. Would you put it on again, please? I'll give you the meanings of the seals. <coughs> Here we go. First of all, we have two Latin words. The words there mean annual chapters, which means announcing the conception of. If I was sitting here tonight, I'd tell you what, I'd be writing notes, everybody, some of you younger folks. You've got to tell your friends at school about this. Get yourself an American dollar, frighten all your friends. <laughs> annual chapters announcing the conception of or birth of a novus ordo seclorum. The word seclorum is where we get our word secular from, means the absence of God. The word ordo means order, and the word novus means new. Let's put the whole thing in sequence now. Lucifer, or Satan, is saying, I am announcing the conception or birth of a secular, heathenistic, new world government, new world religion, new world money system, and new world law system, over which I will be in complete control. And uh, when I was in America, I said to them, you should be asking this question, why is there a pyramid on the back of the American dollar? What link-up is there between Egypt and America? Answer, none at all, except in the field of the occult. And tomorrow night I'll be answering the question, why is there a pyramid on the back of the American dollar? We now look at the other side. We see a bird which we recognize as an eagle, but it's not really. The Freemasons tell us it is a phoenix. Now, what's a phoenix? A mystical bird that burns in the fire and rises from its own ashes at a later time in history. Man's first attempt to set up a world government was called the Tower of... Babel or Babel, 
But in the last days, God is uh, watching from heaven as the last attempt of man to set up a world government called by Jimmy Carter, Global 2000, by George Bush Sr., New World Order in the year 1990. What the father started, the son is supposed to finish. But something's gone wrong. George Bush has become a Christian. <laughs> and he's on the telephone to his father regularly, but there's trouble brewing. And I want you to know that <clears throat> each of these men, both of those men, plus their grandfather, the old man Bush, belong to a satanic society. And if you've ever had a chance to look at it, there's a, a video out called The Skulls. Who's seen The Skulls? You get hold of that. It shows you views inside the Skulls Hall at Yale University. And it'll, it'll say at the beginning of the film, three American presidents have belonged to this group, the Skulls. It's also called 322, and it's also called the Order. <clears throat> now, let's move on with this for a moment. Would you notice, first of all, some details? The bird is looking to the right. He's a right-wing bird. What does that mean? It means we're not going to have a socialistic, communistic world government. It will be an extreme right-wing dictatorship, exactly as the Bible says, Antichrist. Would you notice the bird has a ribbon in his mouth, and on the ribbon are written the words, Er pluribus unum. What does that mean? It means out of many, one. The original idea was to take the 13 colonies of America and set up the United States of America. Now they are privatizing every country. Privatizing? You've heard the word? <clears throat> and what are they doing? They're selling out your assets overseas. New Zealand is about 80-something percent in overseas hands, and you guys are about 70-something percent in overseas hands. They've sold you out, but you didn't know it. If you come to my country, who owns the railways? The Americans. Who owns the Cook Strait ferries? The Americans. Who owns telecom? The Americans. Who owns the buses in Wellington and Auckland? Stagecoach buses from Scotland. Who owns uh, the newspaper in Auckland, the biggest one in the country? New Zealand Herald, an Irishman called O'Reilly. If you go to America, who owns the Rockefeller Center? The Japanese. <clears throat> who owns Pebble Beach Golf Course, Monterey, California? The Japanese. Who owns 7-Eleven? The Japanese. And everywhere you look, there's everybody buying into everybody's country. And your country is being invested in until you are losing it bit by bit. When you privatize, you sell out, you see, as you'll see. So the idea is to sell out everybody's sovereignty, to sell out everybody's independence and make you independent, interdependent. Now, what is New Zealand responsible for now? Answer, pine trees. Do we have any Kiwis here tonight? Some, some of you, all right. Now, what do you know about New Zealand? We used to be famous for sheep, cattle, uh, dairy products. Not now. They're driving the cattle and the sheep off, and they're planting pine trees. You look at the, the wharves all around New Zealand. Every wharf I go to is logs, logs, piles, millions of them. I was up in Whangarei the other day up north. I've never seen so many logs in my life. There are millions of them. What are they selling to? Japan and Korea and other countries. You come to this country, you were famous for steel, uh, sheep, cattle. Not now. They shut down the steel mills at Wollongong, Newcastle. What else do we notice? We notice they were driving sheep into big holes in the ground here years ago and shooting them by the million. Did you know that? I saw it on television here. Then they said the cattle up in Queensland had TB and so they shot them. Then they said later they didn't have TB. What's your country famous for now? One thing, wheat. You are responsible for the southern hemisphere, wheat. Canada is wheat for the northern hemisphere. Germany, luxury cars, you see. Italy, designer clothes. Uh, Israel, uh, uh, fruit. Every kind of fruit in the world grows in the Sharon Valley in Israel between Haifa and Tel Aviv, you see. Every country's got one main product. Uh, what is it? What's the other one? Uh, Switzerland, clocks, chocolates, and stolen gold. <laughs> <coughs> Interesting, eh? So, yeah, so there you go. Anyway, so the aim of the exercise is ultimately there will be no more Australians, no more Kiwis, no more South Africans, no more English, no more Chinese, no more Japanese. We will all be members of a global village, out of many, one, you see, and we'll have our arms around each other's shoulders. We will sway backwards and forwards, <laughs> singing the song, We Are the World. We are the world. Would you notice that the bird has 13 arrows in one claw, 13 olive branches in the other, and that speaks of a millennium of world peace. This millennium is going to take us into a time of peace, they say. 
They're going to get rid of the arrows. That's a time of war and they'll set up a time of peace. But I want to say without Jesus, there is no peace. He's called the Prince of Peace. And if you crucify the Prince of Peace, what chance have you got? And so anybody who joins the peace movement, of course, wears a thing like this around their neck, um, a broken cross upside down. And when you join witchcraft, you get one of those. They give you a cross. You turn it upside down. It's either made of plywood or ceramics. And you go snap, you snap the crossbars and you're blaspheming. You say, we don't want you, Jesus, Prince of Peace. We'll bring peace by ourselves. But Jesus says, there is no peace, says my God for the wicked. You know, when you receive Jesus as your savior, it's exciting. You can stand a bit of peace. You can walk up the street without a walkman on. Isn't that exciting? You can actually get up in the morning without the radio or television on. You can actually listen to the sound of the birds. How exciting. And so we see then that these two seals here, there's 13s everywhere. 13 is the witchcraft number, of course. Now here's something you need to see. Did you know that you can cut this thing in half, put it on a transparency, place one half on the other, and you'll find the two seals fit exactly one on top of the other. Have a look at this, please. There's one. You put that one right on top there and put each circle on top and they're a massive witchcraft and Masonic symbolism. Not easy. Once you get practice, you get it. Okay, that's all right now. You get the idea, everybody? Do it yourself when you get home. Get yourself a dollar, put it on the transparency, cut it in half, and show your friends. If you want to know the meaning of all this, one, that's it. Stop there. Don't move. Yeah. If you want to find the meaning of these uh, seals here, buy a book called um, oh, Stan Dayo's book. Someone help me. Cosmic Conspiracy by Stan Dayo. He explains the meaning of these seals. They're put together. This is very carefully designed by witchcraft people. We're living in the last days. We've got a spiritual problem on our hands. Now, I don't think this is an economic problem or a religious problem or a political problem. No, it's a spiritual problem and it needs a spiritual answer. And the answer is the biggest name on my chart. His name is Jesus. <coughs> Let's read this together, shall we? This is the statement I gave you before from the book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. Let's read together, shall we? Not only were many of the founders of the United States government Masons, but they received aid from a secret and august body existing in Europe which helped them establish this country for a peculiar and a particular purpose known only to the initiated few. Now listen everybody, George Bush Sr. in 1990 enunciated that purpose. It was to set up a new world order. His son, George W. Bush, has to finish the job that his father started 10 years ago. Now when I was in America, um, I don't often say this, but I might as well say it here tonight, my driver, who has carried all the prophetic preachers across America before me, told me, he said, every time we get to a bridge, you watch. And we went through 38 states in two and a half weeks, and every bridge we got, went near, there were men working underneath it, putting in steel girders. He said, that is for the United Nations tanks that are going to come in and take over America shortly. Is everybody clear what I'm saying tonight? This goes on tape. The whole of America will be inundated with United Nations troops. In fact, they're training now in Alamogordo, New Mexico. I, my son and I were over there some time ago. We were building a church up in the Rocky Mountains, and I, I dug out the foundations. I put that in. My son's a carpenter. I said, I'm going back to New Zealand now, son. I've had enough. You carry on. Build your church. So I went home. I left him to it. He said, he rang me when I got home. He said, Dad, the same day you left, he said, I went down to the restaurant run by a Mexican fella called Julio. <clears throat> he said, there I was, <coughs> excuse me, he said, there I was sitting ready for my meal and the waiter came up to me and he said, do you know that there are 250,000 United Nations troops from Germany and Russia training in Alamogordo, New Mexico at the Air Force base there? He said, my dad told me that. He said, it's true. And very shortly, what they're going to do, George Bush is going to send the American troops out of the country to all these trouble spots called the Axis of Evil. And while he's got his own troops out of the country, the United Nations will take over America and imprison Christians and imprison patriots because they're going to introduce their one world government. Anybody who is against it will be in prison. So I, I guess I'd be a candidate, wouldn't I? Okay, let's move quickly on. And that's on tape, what I'm saying tonight. The biggest base they've got ready for the prisoners is in Alaska. The Alaskan prison camp is over a million square acres up there. 
and many of the military bases in America are closing down and they're turning them into prison camps. And I've got the video at home showing these prison camps and the facilities they've got already there for imprisoning Christians. But praise God, we're serving a winner. Yeah. Hallelujah, everybody. It's got to come down to a confrontation, you see. There must be a confrontation, the peculiar, particular purpose for which America was set up. Okay, that'll be enough of that. Do something else now. Have a look at this Freemason. Here's a Freemason. You say, what's a Freemason? He's a man who joins a society he knows nothing about. There he is, look. Let's read that together. A man who joins a society he knows nothing about. Have a look at this man. He's all ready for the initiation, look. There's his mask over his eyes, running noose around his neck, shirt rolled up over his chest, trouser leg rolled up, slipper on one foot, and there he is. You'll see he's been, been to McDonald's once too often. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Did you know <coughs> that when you travel a lot, people give you good food? You've got to watch that. It's not easy, Brother Norm, you know. People like us have got to watch our figures. Uh, when I went home one time, I was getting a bit large, and one of the young fellows in New Zealand said, Uncle Barry, he said, yes, son, he says, I've got a cure for you. I've got a latest diet out. What's the latest diet? He said, uh, garlic and onions for six weeks. I said, what else do you eat with it? Nothing, just that. I said, how does that help? He said, from a distance, you look a lot thinner. <laughs> All right. Now have a look at this man here, please. <coughs> <laughs> Here's a man, he's a mason. He's damned with oaths and curses and obligation. I want you to read the statement of a man called Mencius. Down here, please. To act without understanding, to follow a path all one's life without knowing where it really leads, such is the behavior of the multitudes. That is a powerful statement. Now, the whole city of Washington, D.C. has the Masonic symbols built into the streets. Some of you might think I'm pushing the masons of it. That's exactly right. I am pushing it because they are the key to the whole problem here. In, in Washington, D.C., these are streets. Have a look at them. Some of you heard of the New Zealand footballer, Michael Jones. He's part of our family, that boy, and he's a, he's a street designer. I said to him one day, Michael, I said, you tell me, what do you see there? He said, I see, I see the grid system. That's very clear. But in the middle of the grid system, you've got these strange ones coming like that. Look, that's a compass, and that's a square. Now, did you know that in Freemasonry, it has a lots of sexual overtones, and they say that that represents the male organ, that is the... Um, the compass and the square represents the female organ. It is the uniting of the physical and the esoterical, the spiritual from the heavens, you see. And down here we have what is called the five-pointed star. Can you turn it on its side, please, sister? That's it. The one point down, notice that? A little further. Notice the one point down. What they do in witchcraft is they put the goat's head in that. It's called the pentagram. So the goat's head goes there. We'll have a look at it. Here it is here. <coughs> There it is. The goat of Mendes is the name of the goat. The name of the devil inside the, the, the goat is Barfomet. That's a demon. He's got two horns up there, two ears out here, the beard of the goat. Now, if you go back to the other one again, the map, you'll see that the White House has got two points there of witchcraft. The end of the compass and the beard of the goat stops right at the White House. President W. Bush, George W., is actually influenced by witchcraft from two different directions. That's why he's in a very, very serious job, believe me. Now we move on. He also belongs to a secret society, as did his father before him, called the Skulls. <coughs> that's, the, that's the front of a book written by Anthony Sutton. It's a German secret society, and George Bush belongs to this. It comes out of Yale University. His father belonged to it, and his uh, grandfather before him. Recognize this. If you belong to that society, you have to have a secret name. Because the skull and bones is the modern version of the Illuminati. Everybody hear me? The skull and bones is the modern version of the Illuminati. So George Bush, senior, in 1990, who said New World Order, he introduced it. Do you know what his secret name was? Anybody know? Poppy. Write it down, please. Poppy. I was having a meeting in Upper Hutt the other day. Some of you Kiwis know where that is. Lower Hutt, having meetings there. And a man stood up in my meeting. He said, I went to school with George Bush. He said, we used to call him Poppy. And while I was in the States, I went through those 13 major cities and I made inquiries. I said, what is the name of his son? What's his secret name? I found it. 
George W. His secret name is Temporary. I said, if I had a name like that, I'd be very nervous. <laughs> now, why do you think he's called Temporary? I'll tell you. George W. Bush, here's his history. A man who doesn't know very much about world events at all. He was a drunkard. He used to drink Jim Beam whiskey. He wandered around in Chinese slippers and cast off clothing. Um, one day his wife, Laura, said to him, I'm sick of this, George. I don't like living like this. Will you give up the whiskey or will you give me up? She, he said, I'll give up the whiskey. So they called Billy Graham around. Billy Graham prayed the sinner's prayer with him. And George W. Bush has prayed that prayer. He has been born again into the family of God. That's good news. Whenever he flies over America, he prays for the country. He reads his Bible every morning. He does Bible studies. But the problem is, he has also been born into a satanic group. And his name is Temporary. You can see why, can't you? Because they tell him what to do. And when he makes a speech, if he goes off his speech, he doesn't know what to say. Honestly, you watch him. He's got to keep reading his speeches because they tell him and his speechwriter what to say. And I, was, I said the other day, May, I said to my wife, come and watch this. He's going off his speech. It was awful. I'm not being rude to him. He's just not, he doesn't know about world events. He doesn't know anything about overseas leaders. He'd only been out of the country once. He'd been to northern Mexico, that's all. And now he's got the job as the world's leader. He's got to listen to his speechwriters. So what happens is this. Because the man belongs to two different groups, God has got to get him out of the bad one into the good one. And when I was in America, I said, don't you use this information against him politically, please. I said, you pray for your president because there are people in this meeting tonight who have done things before you received Jesus of which you are now ashamed. And George W. was no exception. He joined that society before he received Christ. It is God's job to get him out. Just pray. At least he's better than the alternative. George, what's the other guy's name? Al Gore. I remember reading about Al Gore during the elections. One of the columnists said, Al Gore is so boring, his secret service name is Al Gore. <laughs> oh, to be a politician, what a horrible job. <laughs> okay, what do we know about the order? Well, we'll have a look. <laughs> thank you, Ray, thank you. Is everybody still alive? Yes. I often wonder what it's like to come to one of my meetings. I just can't imagine sitting there listening to all this. Okay, let's, let's read it together, shall we? Chapter 322, it's called that, is a secret society whose members are sworn to silence. Above all, the order is powerful, unbelievably powerful. The order meets annually, patriarchs only, on Deer Island in the St. Lawrence River. When a new member is initiated into the order, they say, tonight he will die to the world and be born again into the order as he will have a new name and 14 new blood brothers also with new names. And if you see the film called The Skulls, you'll see on the wall of the, of the order, the lodge, called The Order or The Skull and Bones, it's got the word war, W-A-R, and that's why George Bush is always having wars. He's got to send his people off to Afghanistan, and then he says, he speaks about the, tri the axis of evil. He's talking about Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. You see, he's always got to be ready to send the troops somewhere else. This is the policy of the lodge. Also, on the wall of the lodge is a, a swastika, a German swastika, for it is a German secret society. Very evil indeed. Dedicated to world government, and the president of America still belongs to that society because you can never get out unless you're killed or unless you die. Next one, please. Watch this one. The order has either set up or penetrated just about every significant research, policy, and opinion-making organization in the United States, in addition to the church, business, uh, and government, and politics. The evolution of America reflecting individual opinion, ideas, and decisions at the grassroots is simply not true. On the contrary, says Anthony Sutton, the writer of this book, the broad direction has been created artificially and stimulated by the order. He's a brilliant writer, this guy. Next, please. <coughs> I think we've done that one. It's all right, though. Here it is. Now, watch this one. The order follows the philosophies of George Hegel, a German philosopher. All historical events emerge from a conflict between opposing forces. Excuse me, everybody. You must have a conflict before we get the new world order. That's why everywhere there's a change, they have a conflict. E.g., South Africa. Now, he divides the world. This philosopher called Hegel... He says part of the world is thesis, the other half is antithesis, and when you bring them together, that is called synthesis. 
Let's look at South Africa, shall we? Thesis, Nelson Mandela, ANC. Antithesis, Butelezi, the Zulus. There is no chance of peace between the two groups. Henry Kissinger goes over there. The next thing, he brings them together, and they have a, the, the rainbow nation, the new South Africa. It happens. That is called synthesis. <coughs> Illustration, you go to Ireland. You've got the Union in the north with Ian Paisley. You have Jerry Adams and the IRA. There's no chance of peace there. Henry Kissinger goes over there with a group. And before you can say Jack Robinson, there is some sort of peace in uh, Ireland. Uh, what else? America and Russia. America, thesis. Russia, antithesis. At a certain time in history, they come together and they now have a headquarters running space program together. It used to be you hate each other. They said the axis of evil. They said the evil nation, satanic and so on. Next thing you see, you see uh, Ronald Reagan next to Gorbachev. And now it's Ronnie and Gorby. <coughs> They've got their arms around each other and they're having a photo taken. That's called synthesis. There's only one more big one they want to do. That's Israel, thesis, Arabs, antithesis. And at the right time, using the Hegelian dialectical philosophy, they will bring those two groups together in a seven-year treaty, fulfill the Bible prophecy, and Jesus will come again. Woohoo! Okay, now they say, well, if that's the case... The question is asked by Hegel, if it is true that they organise all the governments around the world, even your government in Canberra is run by the order. If that's the case, what is the use of having so many people in Parliament? And here's the answer here. This is what Hegel says. The function of a government or Congress is to give the impression the peasants have some value. <laughs> so when they pass a law, it makes them feel good. And they allow them to feel like that, but they control the ultimate destiny of every country on earth. All right? <coughs> now, someone said to me in America, can you prove George Bush belongs to that group? Yes. You say, how can you prove it? It's in our newspaper in New Zealand. Have a look at this. <coughs> this is taken from the New Zealand Herald on the 26th of April, 2001. Skullduggery uncovers Bush's bony secrets. The bizarre rituals of one of America's most exclusive clubs, which counts President Bush and his father among its members, has been laid bare by a hidden camera. The, someone put a camera up on the roof of the Skull and Bones Club. The all-male Skull and Bones Club at Yale University has long been held up as an example of the powerful cabals that run America from behind the scenes. Soon after he entered the White House, George W. Bush <coughs> held a private dinner for his year of bonesmen, as they are called. It is the initiation ceremony of this year's members caught by fellow Yale students on a night vision camera that has set things astir. Over here, please. During the initiation, new members undergo a mock throat-cutting ceremony. They then take turns to lie in a coffin and recount their personal and sexual histories to forge a bond of secrecy within the club. Having died as barbarians, they step from the coffin, reborn as members of the order. Members remain in the club for life. And that's why poor George is called temporary. He's in a very sticky position at the moment. No wonder he looks a bit nervous when he comes on television. Okay. We now move quickly on. Now, the building of the world government, thank you, is likened to the building of a house. I think you'll enjoy this bit. When you build a house, do we have any builders here tonight, please? Don't be a shy, brother. That's all right. Yeah, God bless you. <laughs> We're not against you. <laughs> Anybody who builds a house will know you start with a foundation. Who agrees with that? You don't even have to be a builder to know that. Where's the foundation? We've lost it. Here it is. Now, the foundation of the World Government House was the Illuminati, 1776. We all know that now. We've done that. The next thing you do is you build a framework, and they chose New Zealand as the framework. I'll explain how it happened. Now, I know that <clears throat> in many cases... People over here think New Zealand is a very small country. Geographically, it's the same size as Great Britain. The only difference is it has less people. And it's very quiet. When I go to England, I'll be there next month, God willing. I've got a month in England again. And when I go twice this year, we go twice this year to England. When you go to Heathrow Airport, you can hardly get there. There's so many cars. And when you get back to New Zealand, you might get off the plane at Christchurch, drive home 200 miles, and I might pass two motor cars. And if I do, I say to my wife, my word is busy tonight. <laughs> How many people have we got? Three and a half million. How many have they got in England? 160 million, isn't it? A country the same size as New Zealand. 
and they chose it for a test case, and this is how it happened. Let me draw it for you. Here it is. There's New Zealand. North Island, South Island, Stewart Island. Here's your country here. Always put Tasmania in, they get excited. <laughs> <laughs> Over here, put in the date line, you see? Now, why did they choose New Zealand as a test case for the world government? The reason is that we are close to the date line and we start the computers every day. So when the sun hits Mount Hikarangi, uh, the computers roll in New Zealand, then they roll around Eastern Standard Time, Central Standard Time, Western Standard Time, over there and around the world. My wife comes from an island called Samoa. I will draw a map of that for you. There. <laughs> now, watch this. Watch this, everybody. If you have Christmas dinner here, you have Christmas dinner there the next day. So you have two Christmas dinners. It's all right. It's, it's a bit difficult if you're a Seventh-day Adventist. You're not sure what to do. <laughs> you're not sure whether that's the right one or that one. In fact, it is so confusing. Listen, everybody, I'm not being rude. It's so confusing to the Seventh-day people that when you go to Tonga, they have their Seventh day on Sunday. And I went there. We've been to Tonga a few times. I went down to their church. I said, why are you worshipping on Sunday? You're Seventh-day Adventist. They said, somebody fiddle with the international date line. <laughs> Honestly, interesting. Anyway, the point is this. That because we are next to the date line here, we start the money system. We are important to the world government people. Secondly, we are a small nation that are very easy to manipulate. The motto of New Zealand is, she'll be right. And the Australian motto, she'll be right, mate. <laughs> That's why they do anything to us at all. We are very relaxed sort of people. There's no, not much excitement in our country. We're not excitable people. Over in America years ago, they had a program on television. Do you remember it? That's incredible. You'd have a fellow like Evil Knievel riding his motorbike over the Grand Canyon. And all the Americans jump up and shout, that's incredible. <clears throat> New Zealand tried to make one like that. Their program was called, That's Fairly Interesting. <laughs> There's just not much excitement over there, honestly. We have been described as a passionless people. A passionless people. Honestly, it's just like that. A lot of Englishness in us, you know. Anyway, I remember one day we were travelling on the Cook Strait ferries. We live in the South Island. We travel north on the ferry, three hours. And one day a yacht turned over in Cook Strait. So the captain of the ferry is a friend of mine. His name was Laurie Collins. He turned the big ferry sideways to block the wind while they conducted a rescue on the yacht. And all the American tourists were excited, man. They were standing along the rail shouting and clapping and whistling. And there's a little group standing behind them. I saw this American guy turn around and he says, Say, aren't you guys excited? I said, no, we're New Zealanders. <laughs> <laughs> we're just like that. We're quiet people. We... <laughs> I never forget my first trip over here. My first trip over the Dateline in 1960. The pilot was playing a trick on us. He said, he said, we're about to cross the date line, ladies and gentlemen. Please fasten your safety belts. So I could hear them clicking on all around me. And when we got to that area, he pulled the controls and the plane went like this. And I heard an old lady say, did you feel it, dear? <laughs> now, to those of you who can't see the joke, it's an imaginary line. It's not really there. You've got to explain everything these days, you know. <laughs> I heard another story I like. Just to have a break for a minute. I like the story of the, um, the guy who's going over the Middle East on a plane. And he's got a telescope. He's looking out the window. And an elderly lady next to him said, What is that, son? He said, That's a telescope, madam. She said, What are you looking for? He said, The equator. <laughs> she said, I've always wanted to see that. If you happen to see it, would you let me see it? <laughs> a few minutes later, he says, there it is, there it is. She snatched the telescope, put it to her eye, and he pulled her hair out of his head. <laughs> and he put it in front of the lens. He said, he said, can you see the equator, madam? 
She said, not only can I see the equator, there is a camel walking along it. <laughs> and so, so in the year in the year 1961, some of you will know that the International Monetary Fund came to New Zealand in 1961 and they said to our Prime Minister, would you like some money? Can we lend you some money? Now we didn't need to borrow the money, we were doing so well. Farmers in Aussie and New Zealand in 1961 were doing very well indeed. They were carrying hay bales in the back of their cars, everything was great, you know. And then in 1961, our Prime Ministers of the day borrowed money from the IMF. They should never have done it. The Prime Minister of New Zealand was called Sir Keith Holyoke. The Prime Minister here was called Menzies. I asked that last time I was here. Someone called it Harold Holt, remember? And some of you may remember Harold Holt, the man who disappeared at the beach. I met a man in Queensland one time and he said to me, did you know that the same frogman that killed um, Harold Holt is the same frogman that killed Robert Maxwell off his yacht? I said, where did you hear that? He says, I was talking to Elvis Presley at the supermarket this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Write down joke next to that one, please. <coughs> In 1961, <coughs> the IMF came to New Zealand and they came to Australia and we borrowed money. Now, notice this, please, loans. Now, the moment we borrowed the money, we wrecked the, the economy of the country. That's when we started to get unemployment. Everything got out of balance. Your man Menzies borrowed the money also. And what we didn't realise was they signed conditions. They don't use the word conditions. That's too small. They have to use another word, conditionalities policies, you see. The longer the words, the more uh, 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 difficult it is to understand. Why don't they just say conditions? Oh, I can't use that. It's too simple. Conditionalities policies, see. So the average Aussie or Kiwi looks at that. What the dickens does that mean? No one knows. <laughs> So what happens is we get the money and we keep paying interest on this and the farmers are having a ball. They're buying two tractors instead of one. They're buying extra farms over here and over here. Everything's going well. And then in the year 1987, 26 years later, they come back again and the Prime Minister Holyoke is dead. Menzies is dead. We've got new Prime Ministers and they say you will now fulfil the conditions. 26 years later. And I'm going to call out these words. If you recognise them, please call out, say something, would you? So I know you're still awake. The first word we saw coming up in the paper, it's a new word, restructuring. And all, the, all our folks said, what on earth does that mean? And all our clever friends said it means they're going to change things around and make things more efficient. And when you go overseas, they don't use exactly the same word. You go to South Africa, they call it structural readjustment. But what it really means is they sack thousands of government workers. Why? Because they're going to sell the assets and there's no longer be any, will, will be any work for those people. So you sack them and you give them money in a brown paper envelope. They walk down the road. Their job is gone forever. They might pay a redundancy fee of $30,000 even to get rid of the guy because he's never coming back and that job will never be replicated again. So off he goes. It used to be called getting the sack. Now it's called being made redundant. When you go to South Africa, a guy walking down the road with his brown paper envelope, what's happened to you? He says, I've just been structurally readjusted. <laughs> <laughs> you go through the border into Zimbabwe, over there they call it ESAP, Economic Structural Adjustment Program. You go through the border into Zambia, up to the north, they call it SAP, Structural Adjustment Program. Every country is slightly different, and they all have little catchwords they use. Do you remember the catchwords they used here? There is some belt tightening to be done. Here's another one. There is some pain to be endured. They talked about a level playing field and light at the end of the tunnel. The only light at the end of the tunnel is the coming of Jesus. Amen. You believe me. <coughs> so with all these funny little catchwords, the next word we saw in the paper a few days later was corporatization. The word is so big, it's not even in the dictionary. It's so new too. So we said to all our clever university friends, what does that mean? They said, well, because governments are not very good at organising things, they're not efficient, we're going to turn government departments into corporations and they'll run things better. And all the Kiwis said, oh good. 
we woke up a few mornings later, the new word is privatisation. We said, what does that mean? Never seen it before. This is 1987. It's a new word, you see. Never seen it. And they said, oh, it's going to make things more efficient because these corporations are going to be taken out of government hands and put into private hands. They're better at business. And all the Kiwis said, oh, good. A few mornings later, we wake up, the new word in the paper is shares. We smell a rat. Sniff, sniff. We say, you're not selling these shares overseas, are you? Oh, no, says the government. We're only selling 49% overseas, and we're keeping 51% in the country. And all the Kiwis said, oh, good. Because, you see, because, you see, look, 49% overseas, and then 51% in the country. Now, we went to preach in a place called Sri Lanka. You've heard of that? Which used to be called Ceylon. And while I was speaking there, there was a massive meeting. We had big meetings there in Colombo. I said, what is your catchword here? And I laughed when they said it. It's so funny. You wouldn't guess their catchword. Their catchword is peopleization. <laughs> You're allowed to laugh, folks, if you want to, you know. Peopleisation, I said. That's a goodie. And I said, what does that mean, for goodness sake? They said that when they sell the government departments, they sell 49% overseas, they keep 51% in the country. Those are called the peopleisation shares. What happens next? One of these guys gets on the telephone, he calls someone in New York in a position of power and says, let's have a little stock market collapse, shall we? So they rocked the stock market for 24 hours. Do you remember it went down some time ago? And when it went down... One of these groups gets a fright. Who gets a fright? The overseas well-known investors or the little peopleisation people? These little people get a fright. They sell their shares to these guys. And at that point, what used to be yours is gone forever. Paid for by your father's tax money, your grandfather's tax money, your tax money. You've lost the asset forever. It's called state-owned enterprise, SOEs, or the family silver goes overseas. So when you see the word privatisation in future, add another word to it, and the word is goodbye. <laughs> and another word, forever. You will never see it again. It's gone. Now, at that stage, the government has got a whole handful of money. Where do they get their money from? The guys that bought the assets. So what do they do with the money? They pay back the IMF from their loans from 1961. Where does that leave Australia? It leaves them with no money and no assets. So what do you do next? You call in investors. And if your investors don't come, your country goes down the tube. And so you call investors. Where do they come from? Now, if you're taking notes, write this down, please. The world has been divided into three groups, three areas. Number one, listen carefully to what I'm saying now. I'm speaking to you on the 15th of May in the year 2002. The world has been divided officially into three groups, ready for the final world government when they bring it all together. And here it is. Number one group, Europe, with their own standing army, and their own currency, the euro dollar, affecting the lives of 300 million people at this stage. I was in Cairo last year. As I drove through Cairo, I saw these big black limousines. I said, what's happening here? They said, Egypt is going to adopt the euro also. Many countries in Africa will adopt the euro because every country in the world must be connected to one of these three groups. Group number two is uh, the Americas, from the tip of uh, Alaska in the north to the tip of South America in the south and they will all be adopting the American dollar, getting rid of their own national currencies. The first country to give up their money was Guatemala. They are now using the American dollar, and Argentina, which is bankrupt, is now going the same way. They will be using the American dollar shortly. In fact, right through there, they'll get rid of all their currencies, and they'll have their own standing army and the American dollar. Region number three to which we belong, everybody listen, we are called APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, and we now belong to Asia. Asia, Australia and New Zealand are one region and we will have our own standing army and our own currency shortly. I doubt very much whether it'll be a dollar. It'll probably be a won or a yen, an Asian currency, because we are small fish in a very big pond. And that is why you see many Asian folk coming here because this is the region they belong to now. Get the idea, please? So that being the case, everybody, although it looks like a strange sort of a setup, it's quite good in a way because every country is now being infiltrated with others and we don't have to send missionaries, the people are coming to us. <laughs> Get the idea? And not only that, this is a heathen country. Australia is a heathen country. And many of these dear folk coming in are strong Christians who can do a job for Jesus. Amen. Praise God. 
So you can't go overseas and preach to the Muslims, they'll chop your head off. But you can preach to them here, you see. That's good news. And so, all right. And the last stage in New Zealand after investors was MMP. We brought in a coalition government. Do you have a coalition here? A coalition government means weak government. And in New Zealand we have all sorts of strange things happening. We've got, we've got one who's a, what is he? He's a man pretending to be a woman. Georgina is, is its name. We've got another guy with dreadlocks because he's been on a farm. You know, he's got all the stuff in his hair. Um, he, he, he comes to Parliament on a skateboard. We've got another guy who used his money to buy a new set of underpants, about $85, I think they were. It's just incredible. It's just stupid. Politics has gone nuts. Wherever you have a coalition, you've got a weak government. E.g., Israel, coalition, weak government. E.g., Italy, coalition, weak government. E.g., Australia, coalition, weak government. E.g., New Zealand, coalition, weak government. And that's exactly what they want, a weak government. We can now be controlled from overseas by the guys who have bought the assets, you see. Because once you've sold your assets, you've lost your power. So there we are. Okay, so New Zealand, we'll put on our map again, love, please. Now, when you put up your framework, that's been done in New Zealand 1987, and every country is following the New Zealand plan. What do you do next, builders? You call in the electrician. And the electrician was called Y2K. A lot of people thought Y2K was a failure. No, it wasn't. Get ready to listen to what it really meant. We learned afterwards what it really meant, not before, unfortunately. Y2K was designed by a woman in 1957 called Grace Hopper. Write down 1957 if you're taking notes, please. Grace Hopper and a team of scientists built a card called the Hollerith card, H-O-L-L-E-R-I-T-H -L -L -E card, which had 80 spaces. In order to save space on the card, because they only had 80 places to put their information, they chopped out all the 19s, you see. 1957 became 57. In the year 1967, 10 years later, the Bureau of Standards, an official American government department, ratified that fact that from now on all computer firms had to use just two digits for the date, which was, nine, which was 6 7 instead of 1967. Everything went well until about the year 1999, but however, anybody who drives a motor car should know that when your speedo gets to 99, you know what comes next, unless you need help. Most people would know it goes to 000, zero, zero you see. And all these computer people knew exactly what was going to happen, but the mainframes weren't quite sure when it got to 00, 000, 1900, because you chopped out the 19, the mainframes built in the old days weren't sure whether it was 1900 or 2000. And magazines like The Time and The Newsweek wrote articles called The Day the World Shut Down and all this sort of stuff. And through fear, look at this everybody, that's the key word, through fear, all the nations on earth upgraded their computers and synchronized them. And the American government chose a guy called John Koskaken with 25 task forces at a cost of $640 billion. How much did it cost altogether? $640 billion. And at a cost of $640 billion, even countries like Africa, South America, that couldn't afford to do so, upgraded, if you're taking notes, and write down the word synchronized. They upgraded and synchronized their computers, and they say we have now entered an electronic new world order. Now listen to what this man says, Koskiken says, as reported in the newspaper USA Today, I can now run the world with three people. No, four people, sorry, four. Let's say it together, I can now run the world with four people. The stage is now set, just the roof on the house to go. And at this moment, you remember last time I was here, four years ago, I think, I told you, I had a cutting which says the collapse of Japan will bring the new world order. And you will know that Japan has collapsed already. They're right on the edge now. They're almost bankrupt. Their banks are collapsing all over the place, and that's why there are not so many Japanese tourists these days. Did you know America has cut the interest rates 11 and a half times already? And the other day, Alan Greenspan of the Federal Reserve says we cannot afford to cut the interest rates anymore. We don't know what to do. America is in a very bad way. Argentina is collapsing. There will be a domino effect worldwide very soon. Big businesses are going down. And even, who is the man today? What's his name? Murdoch. Murdoch's had the biggest collapse of history. It's on today. And he's one of yours. He's an Aussie. He's gone to live overseas. I'm telling you, everybody, the whole money system is going shortly. Now, watch this. 
Years ago, I came to this country. I've been coming here for 30 years now, since 1972. Look at this. Someone gave me this one years ago, an empty wallet upside down laughing. You remember this one? And the words all together, welcome to the cashless society. All together, welcome to the cashless society. Some of you say tonight, I am cashless already. <laughs> I heard of a pastor who was running a church. He said, he said, you know, dear friends, most people in my congregation will know I've spent my time trying to reach the poor of this parish. Judging by tonight's offering, I have succeeded. <laughs> they want to bring in a cashless society. That'll be the roof on the house. And then in comes the mark of the beast. Okay. <clears throat> Everybody still alive? Yes. Gets exciting now. You want some excitement? Here we go. Ooh, who's heard of a man called David Rockefeller? By the way, do you like my new, this is new stuff, you like my new transparencies? When I went to America and showed them my old ones, they were shocked. They said, you're not using these, are you? I said, yeah. I think the man felt sorry for me. He did all new ones for me. They're nice. This was all done in Indiana. Who's the old man in America that does Save, uh, Save the Children Fund? What's his name? Anybody know? Save the Children Fund. They recorded this message in his studio in Indiana. Well known old guy. Just forgot. Anyway, on with this. Now let's read what David Rockefeller says. We are on the verge, come on, of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. That's David Rockefeller. He is dedicated to world government. Next one, please. Let's read this one, taken from the globalization of world politics. Our world system cannot continue to reproduce itself. A crisis within a peculiar, particular world system heralds its end and replacement by another system. Now, the crisis that was chosen was the bringing down of the Twin Towers. Because you know, everywhere you go in the world, they say the world will never be the same again. It was very cleverly designed. They worked in, in collaboration with the guys who flew the planes and the world government people who put charges in the building and demolished it. And if you saw those buildings, they were imploded. People heard explosions. And if you look at the pictures of them, they came down like that, just like that. They didn't fall sideways or anything like that. And if you read the information on how those towers were built, you will see it was impossible to happen what happened there. Now, that's interesting. So I'm telling you, I've got the information on this. And that was the crisis that brought about the change that was needed to, that, to bring about a world government. How many people died? 3,000. It was a blood sacrifice to Lucifer. A blood sacrifice to Lucifer. You're dealing with a satanic plan here. And those people were sacrificed in order to bring in a crisis that would bring about a system where you were under observation at all times. Now, did you know in, in New Zealand now, I don't want to frighten anybody, but you go to New Zealand, they never had any security at the airports, nothing. You go through there now, they will examine all your bags going in and out, even flying within the country. You now go through x-rays. They never had that before September the 11th. And therefore, you see the crisis very cleverly. Done. You say, have they ever done that before? Yes, Hitler did it years ago. Hitler bombed one of his own buildings and blamed the Jews for it. The American government did the same thing at Oklahoma. You remember the Oklahoma bombing of the Murrah Center? They said Timothy McVeigh did it. His bomb hardly did any damage at all. It just damaged the outside of the building. But there were charges laid on the third floor that right against the main beams in that building that brought the whole thing down. And a man called General Major General Parton of the U.S. Air Force was going to go and inspect the area. He said, Timothy McVeigh's bomb hardly did any damage at all. I will prove that. He said, please hold it up until I get there. And they demolished the building before he arrived. There were people on the AT, what is it? A alcohol, tobacco, firearm, ATF, is it? On the top building, the ninth floor, they were all out that day. They knew exactly what they were doing. And the thing was brought down by people setting up world government so they could blame the patriots of whom Timothy McVeigh was one of the members of the Patriot Movement. Get the idea? Now they've done it again to the Trade Center, and people need to understand. You remember the face of Satan in the smoke? Some of you saw that. That was real. That was really there. They can't explain that. <clears throat> the face of Satan was in the smoke. It was a satanic thing. That's the crisis that will bring about the world government, you see. We're now ready to receive chips. We'll receive anything as a form of protecting ourselves. Get the idea? Young people piercing themselves, they'll go for it in a big way. 
I want you to know this, that when I was preaching in Malaysia, I met a woman there who belonged to a religion. She said, when I joined this religion, they put jewels into my body. I had diamonds and rubies and pearls stuck into my flesh by the power of Satan. She said they were called implants. And when I received Jesus, the night I gave my life to Jesus, they all fell out on the floor. Good stuff? <clears throat> they said the ultimate implant, of course, will be the mark of the beast. And that's why Satanists have a little implant in them, so they can be traced by the Satanist movement anywhere in the world. But once we receive Jesus, the implant will come out. But the ultimate is going to come. It's spoken of in the book of Revelation, and it's spoken of in chapter 13. Okay, let's put this one on, please. <coughs> let's read it. On March the 20th, 2001, Japan's on the verge of monetary collapse. September the 11th, the attack on America. September 2001, Greenspan cuts the interest rates for the ninth time. Now he's done it 11 and a half times. Now look at this one. Japan has half a trillion dollars invested in U.S. banks. If they withdraw their currency, an overnight collapse could occur. And I want you to understand the amount is half a trillion dollars. And that means their investments in the Gold Coast. Gold Coast. They take it out, that'll bring down Australia. And if they take it out of England, anywhere in the world, America, they can collapse America overnight. We're right on the edge at this very moment of speaking. This is serious stuff. That will lead on, of course, to the biblical stage. We are now reading in the book of Revelation. Let's read, shall we? Chapter 13, verses 16 to 18, of preparations for the mark of the beast. All together, verse 16. That's the wrong one here, please. 16. Here we go. And speaking of the Antichrist, and he causeth all, come on, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Next one, please. <clears throat> and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, his number is six hundred, three score and six. Now tonight, some of you who were in the meeting years ago <coughs> will know that we have talked about this for many years now. And I'm going to give you the update where we're up to at the moment. What we've noticed is this, that first of all, all of you in this meeting tonight are under the 666 system. And the first number they want on you is your birth date. The next number they want on you is your mesh block. The next one they want on you is your ID. Some years ago, when I wrote my book in 1978, warning, this warning, this one, I said that there was a, <clears throat> a computer opened in Brussels where, every, <clears throat> excuse me, where everybody was going to get three lots of six digits, and they wanted those are your three lots of six. Now, if you follow the British system, your birth date is always written down, day, month, year. The American system altogether, month, day, year. <clears throat> the world government system altogether year, month, day. So if you were born on the 7th of July, 77, 770707, that's the world government format. For example, if you're wanted anywhere in the world, the police can go through all the computers, years, months and days. Anybody got a passport here tonight, please? Could someone bring me their passport, if you don't mind? <coughs> this now. This will give you a shock. Thank you, dear. Thank you very much. You don't mind if I tell the people? Good girl. Okay. Okay. Pastor Norman, what are your eyes like, bro? Good shape, aren't they? Okay. He's going to put his glasses on. I heard of this lady the other day, you know, she was wearing glasses and a friend came to visit her and she said, I didn't know you wore glasses. And this lady said, I didn't know I needed them until the other day I was doing some baking and I killed five chocolate chippies with a fly swat. <laughs> this lady's birthday, can you can see it there? Her birthday? Her birthday. Yes. 29th of October, 57. Is that correct? Where's the owner? Is that correct there? 29th of what? October, 57. Now, we're going to get Pastor Norman to read down below here. Start with 57, if you can see it there. Yeah. Loud voice. Read it out. Yeah. 57. That's the year, 57. 10 10 is October. 2-9. Two 2-9 nine. Two nine is the day. That's it there. Thank you. Now, now stop. Stop. I can't stop it. <laughs> <laughs> He's out of control. 
have a look at this please, down the bottom on your passport on the front page, it's all done in a world government format down the bottom here. Everybody check your passport when you get home, you'll see it there. No matter what country in the world people give me their passport, it's always the same now. It's all ready for a world government, one world government. Now the next thing, thanks Norman, the next thing the world government guys have done, they've divided the world into squares called mesh blocks. <laughs> If you live in Sydney, for example, you could be 0, 2. It's not, but you could be. If you live in Penshurst, it could be 2, 7, the small ur block, and then down to within two streets of where you live, 1, 1. Your mesh block or location is now 0, 2, 2, 7, 1, 1. Six digits again, you see. All they've got to do now is give you an ID, 4, 3, 7, 1, 2, 9. And any Kiwi who drives a motor car has got one already because New Zealand is the test case for every foul thing they do. Did you know they gave us rotten petrol recently in New Zealand? There was a, a, a bunch of rotten petrol they got. No one else would take it. New Zealand took it. <laughs> and you put it in your motor mower and you have a fire. As soon as you pull the cord, the whole thing caught on fire. Cars were catching on fire left, right and centre because of the stupid petrol they gave us. <laughs> I'm going to show you my ID. Everybody look at this. Here it is. <clears throat> I've got an ID now. Look, there it is. <laughs> this is the ID, this is called a driver's license, but it's not, it's an ID. And you have to give them a digital photograph and a digital signature and the old license, which was a lifetime license, they suddenly cancelled and said you can no longer use that, you must get one of these. And they gave us a certain period of time to get it, and if you don't have one of those, the police can stop you, take the car from you, drive it back to the police station until you get one of those. You lose it. A lot of Kiwis are very angry about this, they don't want to take it. And so they just buy another car for $200, you see? <laughs> and the police stations are full of cars. They don't know what to do with it. <laughs> just keep driving these wrecks around. Get the idea? Now, let me tell you about this. Everybody watch. This is not an ordinary photograph. That's a digital photograph. And in order to get it taken, you put your head in a box. You've got to stick your head in this box. Honestly, you do. Which of you have had that done, please? Anybody from New Zealand had that done? You stick your head in this box, is that right, brother? Face in box, and they measure you from there to there, and there, to there. It's called face scan. That's what they're up to. So I could go through Heathrow Airport next month. They've already got mine. They've got my digital signature. They can send it ahead of me, the photograph and the signature, and they'll know who I am. I could wear lenses with different coloured eyes, a wig, change the colour of my skin, dark glasses. They would still know it was me because the thing measured is called face scan. Biometrics, it's called, and that is the name of the game for the ID, which would include my DNA and everything else through linking everything together later on. So praise God, everybody. We understand that they are working hard to catch everybody, but God's got a list in heaven also. Amen. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. Everybody look in the last square over there, right behind those lights. In the second to last square, you'll see there a picture of a book called the Lamb's Book of Life. Anybody whose name is in that book is safe. Anybody who is not in that book is doomed. The Bible says the wages of sin is, but the gift of God is, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Billy Graham, sorry, Billy Sunday, the great preacher of the 1900s, was having a meeting in a university one night. He said, students, if you do not come to the cross and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will have to go to hell, for the wages of sin is death. A university professor jumped to his feet at that point, grabbed the microphone and said, excuse me, Mr. Sunday. He said, you are a fundamentalist preacher, he said with a curl of the lip. But he said, we are intellectuals in this university and we do not believe in the concept of hell. I felt I should say that to clarify the issue. Thank you. He sat down. Billy Sunday took the microphone back again, pointed to the professor and said, that man will not be in hell three seconds before he changes his mind. Jesus said there is a hell. He says there's not. Who knows more, that man or Jesus? Secondly, if there is no hell, why did Jesus die on the cross if there's nothing to save us from? Thirdly, he says, maybe God should have waited for you to have been born and called you in for advice. <laughs> God doesn't want our advice. He just says, don't, don't take the mark. Keep away from this new money system or it'll take you to hell. Very clear. And there is a place called hell. And we wanted to show that to you tonight. Now you say the mark of the beast. What's it like? Here it is here. Let's put it on, please. I've got it here. Put this on, brother, please. The mark of the beast is simply a silicon chip. We've, we've known this for years. 
Have a look at this. This one's called identity chip. It's being used in dogs and cats and fish and birds and horses. Here it is. Look. Have a look here, please. This way. It's simply uh, a glass tube with electronics in it. That's all. Size of a grain of rice. And the strange thing is we've talked about this for so many years, about 30-odd years. And for this year is the year it's all coming out. This year, you know that. A lot of you people have been watching the papers. And that's the one they're using on dogs and cats and fish and birds and horses and so on. And if you want to put one of those into a dog to identify them, use this machine here. It's called a, an injector. Look at this one. It has the little silicon chip in there. You lift the skin on the dog's neck, fire it into his neck. Then if you want to know who the dog is, use this machine here. It's called the scanner. You just go like this, scan, and you push the button, his name is there, Rover. <laughs> Owned by Mr. and Mrs. Brown, 16 King Street, yeah, Penshurst, you see. Telephone number is there, and you can identify every animal walking on the street who has a silicon chip. No offence to those of you in the front row. <laughs> by using the scanner on you. Yes. That's the one, you've got that already. All right, we'll go on with that. Thank you. And so we notice then that going beyond that, they are now saying in the word of God that you can receive the mark in your body in these last days. Let's read, shall we? Revelation chapter 13. In fact, it says people will receive it. We're reading Revelation 13, verses 16 to 18. The, by the way, everybody, I'm going to give you the works this time. You know, you've heard of a hamburger with the works? I'll give you the works. Is that all right? And I'll, I'll stop at a certain time. I know what I'm aiming for. So it won't be too long. Verse 16. Revelation 13, 16. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, say he that had the name, sorry, the mark, the name of the beast or the number of his name, and the number is? Now, I guess we've got some folks from Greece here tonight. You know that Greek is the language which was used to bring about the New Testament. Hebrew was the language brought about to bring the Old Testament. So when you go back to Greek and you, and you go, go for the New Testament, you find that the word mark has a meaning. The word for mark is karagma. Now, you Greek people, don't criticize me. I'm not saying it very well because I can't make that noise in the back of my throat. <laughs> karagma. When I was in Adelaide, I met a lovely Greek family there. They said there was an old Greek word also which goes with that, and the word is karax. It's not used very much today, but it is a Greek word. And so they told me the meaning of it. They said the word karagma means to scratch or to cut into. Now, when was this written up? 96 AD. And now it is being revealed to us in the year 2002. And what does the word karagma mean? To scratch or to cut into. You can check this out with Strong's Concordance. Everybody heard of a concordance? It's a book that tells you how to find verses in the Bible. We had an Australian preacher came to New Zealand years ago. His name was Jim Duffersey. Do you remember him, brother? Open air campaigners. He was a lovely preacher. He got me started. I, I went out preaching with him. And he said, there are three types of concordances. Strong's for the strong, young's for the young, and I've got a crudence. <laughs> All right. Now, the word carax, the word carax means to sharpen to a point. How do you like that? Now, watch this one. In the Greek language, I learned this from my Greek informants, and they, you find this also in Strong's Concordance, six hundreds, six tens, and six units have the following word. First word is uh, chi, z, sigma. Now, what does that mean? Chi, z, sigma. If you add it up and you put it together, this is what it means. It means to prick and mark in recognition of ownership. And I want you to understand, this is the system they have already started using this year, in the year 2002. It's already happening right now, as I will show you. Here we go. Thanks, brother. The Bible says you can take it in the right hand or the forehead. Please yourself. There's the right hand, look. 
The other one, next one please, or the forehead. <laughs> That's how you feel after a meeting. Now have a look at that in the forehead. I remember having a meeting in Aussie somewhere one night and a fellow called out, Mr. Smith, yes? He said, I think they'd rather put the mark in the head than the hand. Why is that? Because you can get your hand cut off and still operate, but once your head comes off, you wouldn't be much use for anything. <laughs> I said, I can see that right away. There it is, hand or head. Very clear. We now move on. If you look carefully now at these cuttings, you have to be careful here, please. We'll go through these and finish the thing off. Everybody look at the paper cuttings now, please. They're advertising it everywhere. First one, take it from the South African newspaper. Power under your skin. New concept implants chips in your body for easy access to a world of benefits. Exactly what the Bible predicted in 96 AD. There's a man opening his shirt. He's got silicon chips in his chest. Next one, please. Here, from the inside of that paper called the... Uh, the star in Johannesburg, chips that get under your skin, why carry cards when an implant will do the trick? Very clear, everybody. This is my job. While you folks are at work, I'm doing this, studying all this stuff, you see? So I pick it all up. Next one, please. There's a guy from Singapore. Some of you from Singapore, the newspaper there called The Straits Times. That's fairly clear, look. No more cards, just a chip in your head. This is the newspaper. This is not a Christian magazine I'm showing you. Next one, please. Taken from a computer magazine called The Silicon Chip. Let's read it together. Today they're tagging animals. Tomorrow it might be humans. We'll take out the word might. We'll put the word will all together. Today they're tagging animals. Tomorrow it will be humans. Next, please. A man in England called Professor Warwick of Reading University. They nickname him Mr. Chip. There he is. He can turn on the TV with a microchip in his arm. The latest thing I learned about him is he's putting one onto his wife and linking it up to the nerve so he can feel what she feels. His wife is not too keen on the idea, I hear. Okay, if you've got your pens out, write this down, please. You can check it on the internet. There it is. The chip they're using now is called Digital Angel, and it's put out by a group called Applied Digital Solutions. It's a unique personal tracking locating recovery system can be implanted in humans and remain in their bodies for years without maintenance of any kind. It's actually maintained by the muscle movement. Regenerates it. It's a regenerating maintenance free power supply there. If you're writing it down, please, Digital Angel, Applied Digital Solutions is the name of the group. You can look it up and tell your friends at work. Next one, please. We're almost finished. So there's the beast in Brussels. Six digits, birth date, year, month and day. And the for this is the world government format. Next one, please. Now watch this one. Read this headline with me, please. My driving license is in my other arm, officer. That's taken from the Evening Standard in London. And the date there, the 15th of January. Oh, I must have been over there. All right, there it is there. Yeah, this year. Okay, next one, please. Have a look at this one. So this, look at this. They've already got it now. This is on the computer. Recently came out. People are queuing up for the computer chip implants. The chipping ceremony will be held in the U.S. state of Florida. It is being performed by Applied Digital Solutions, a Florida technology company. The chip is called the Very Chip. A rice grain sized device sits under the skin. When scanned by a special reader, the chip emits a radio signal, will transmit a code which is linked to a secure database. Applied Digital Solutions says it will field a mobile chipmobile to bring the technology to a waiting list of 5,000. Obviously, they don't go to church. Or if they do, their pastor doesn't tell them about this. The chip implant costs $200 plus $10 monthly fee to the database. The chip is implanted during a simple outpatient procedure in the doctor's office. The company says it is perfecting a larger, more futuristic unit that will have the ability to detect and use locations using global positioning satellites. Now, I want to talk to you for a minute before we take that off. Or that'll do, dear. Just hold it for a minute, please. There. A man called Tesla years ago, Nikola Tesla, a man involved in the building of motors, electric motors and so on and so on, electricity, said, if ever they invent a system like this, not only can you send a message to a satellite, but the message will come back from the satellite. That would mean they could say to you, Lucifer is God. That would go into your chip. 
linked to the nerves in your brain, you would then say with your lips, Lucifer is God, without even wanting to say it. And the Word of God makes it clear, it is not only the receiving of the mark, but the facility for them to plant something in your brain. And so the Word of God makes it clear, don't take the mark, but do receive Jesus. Yeah. That's my message. Next one, please. There it is. There's your mesh block system. Thank you. Next one. We're going well, dear. You're going well there. There it is. Your facial scan and your signature. That's the last one. Next one, please. Here we go. Okay, let's read this. Now, what happens if I receive that mark on my body altogether? And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Just stop for a moment, please. When I was speaking in uh, Penang, it's on the Thailand border, I met a young Australian man. He said, I'm a padre in the prison here. He said, if an Australian guy gets caught with drugs, a certain amount, they, they execute him. They put a white sheet in front of you with a target on. They shoot you through the sheet. Some of you have seen that film called The Bangkok Hotel. I think it's on there. It's frightening. In Malaysia, they got the same penalty. My son, Andrew, he was taken away from me one day. We we're in the queue at the airport, and it has a sign on the wall, penalty for drugs, death. And my wife and I and my son, Andrew, were there. they grabbed Andrew, took him out of the back room, threw him against the wall, went through his Bible. They said sometimes they hollow out the Bible to put drugs in. They checked his guitar case, and every time he went through customs, they kept ripping his cases apart looking for drugs. And we found out what the problem was. There was another guy called Andrew Smith, the same name, born on the same day in the same area in New Zealand. And he was a druggie. And my son was getting the blame. I had to look into it, and I discovered there was one year difference between the two of them. And I talked to the head of police about it. We got him a special permit to get him through customs every time. What a frightening experience for the boy. Even with his wife and kids, the police would take him away every time and rip his bags apart. Now, if you do that in Malaysia and you've got too many drugs, they'll shoot you. But if you've got just a few, they put you in prison for life. And the same applies to Thailand, where this boy worked. He said, I'm a, a, a minister. I go to minister to them. He said, these fellows, they might be 26 years of age. They go into the cell. It's just concrete. It's got a concrete wall on three sides. It's got bars on the front. There is a water channel running down. That is for drinking and toilet. He's got no mat. That's it. He'll be there at the age of 26, and when they say life over there, they mean life. At the age of 60, he will still be there because he never comes out. And I thought, that's horrific. My mind almost turned a loop. And then I thought, hell must be worse than that. At least in Australia, if you go to prison, you can get out after a while, normally speaking. But over there, your life is life, you see. And then I thought, hell. How long does hell last? Let's see, shall we, please? <clears throat> Altogether, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Do you realize that God brought you to this meeting tonight? For a purpose to listen to sense. We're not talking nonsense. I'm not a religious nutter or a fanatic. I'm simply telling you what I've discovered. I'm an ex-school teacher of 15 years experience, but God called me to do this supernaturally. And what I tell you tonight changes the lives of many people if you are willing to humble yourself at the foot of the cross and receive Jesus as your Savior. It's a spiritual problem, needs a spiritual answer, and I encourage you, listen to all this, look at it, and say to yourself, I don't want to go to hell. And my name is Barry Smith. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Amen. Only a fool wants to go to hell because it lasts forever and forever. I was in Auckland at Bible school years ago, and one lunchtime I went to buy myself something up the street. Some of you know Auckland. I went up Simon Street, and on the left there was a shop called Smith and Brown. And a man came out of the shop. He said, you, Barry? I said, yes. He said, remember me? And I said, you're my Bible class teacher. Mr. Cunningham, he said, that's right. He said, let me ask you a question. What are you doing? I said, I'm in Bible school now. He said, I'll ask you a question. Why do people go to hell? He said, you should be able to answer this. You're at Bible school. I said, I think they go to hell because they're sinners. No, no, he said, that's not the answer. He said, you don't have to go to hell. God has provided a way out. He said, the only reason people go to hell is they bypass the cross of Jesus. 
They walk past it knowing what they're doing. <clears throat> Anybody who comes to this meeting tonight and you know what you're doing and bypass the cross, you'll have to go to hell for the wages of sin is death. But if you let Jesus save you, you won't go there because the gift of God is eternal life. Everybody needs to receive Christ and make him their own personal saviour. Let me tell you a story in closing tonight. Is there another one there, dear? Have a look at this one, please. I was travelling in Queensland <clears throat> some years ago on my way to Cairns. In the old truck, we had an old GMC truck over here. Some of you may remember it. We had dual petrol tanks. Do you remember it? Do you, brother? And dual LPG tanks and a, and a radio, a CB radio. I used to preach the gospel to the truckies. Remember down Parramatta Road in Sydney here one night, I said, anybody got their ears on? And you can hear all these truckies. I'm on the truckies channel, you see. And all these Aussie voices, yeah, mate. <laughs> so as you got your ears on, I says, um, <clears throat> where can I find some food at this time of night? Is there a truck stop? And one of the guys says, Jesus Christ, mate, I don't know. <laughs> and you can hear the other truckies laughing in the background because they're all tuned into that channel. So I said, I heard you use that name. I said, that's the name I use every night in my meetings. I said, I'm a preacher. I talk about him every night. And I said, if you receive him, you'll be saved. God wants to save you. And you hear all the truckies laughing all over Sydney, you know, because they're all tuned into the truckies channel. And this guy says, absolute rubbish. He says, you're talking nonsense, mate. He says, when you die, it's all over. So I, I actually primed him up. I said, you mean that when you die, you die like a dog. That's right, he says. You die like a dog. I said, can I tell you why you want to die like a dog? He says, why? I said, so you can live like one. <laughs> and he said, you might be right there, mate. And all the other truckies laughed. And then he says, I worked my backside off. He's done nothing for me. I said, he doesn't have to. Because unless you're born into his family, he is not obligated to do anything for you. But when you receive him, he'll look after you very particularly. Because you become a son of God. Is that right? I said, that's enough of that. Turn him off. <laughs> but I want you to know that God loves people. And as I traveled towards Cairns that night, my family were all asleep. My wife was asleep. My four kids were asleep. I looked out across the bull bars on the front. We used to hit kangaroos with that. You know what it's like at the back? And as I was traveling, I said, Lord Jesus, why do people go to hell? Why send them to hell for 60 or 70 years of sin and for receiving a tiny chip in their head? And the answer came back. There it is. Because your forehead is reserved for the name of your manufacturer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's read it, shall we? Revelation 22, 4. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. I got home one night. Put it off, love, thank you. I got home one night after a long mission. We do this all the time. I had my 69th birthday the other day, brother. I'm going all right. Not as good as this man. What's yours? What are you again? Tell me later. <laughs> but he looks fitter than me and I was over at a place called uh, Miles anybody heard of Miles? on the way to Roma on the way to Charleville out the back I can see now why they called it Miles <laughs> and I had my birthday out there and I thought Lord Jesus you've been so good to me we get home late sometimes you get off the plane and you, you travel home 200 miles you get at home and you three o'clock in the morning, we always go home. doesn't matter where we are. We'll always go home late at night rather than wait for the next day. We're so keen to get back to our own bed. Does that make sense? Yes. Your own pillow, your own bed, nothing like it. So if we finish a meeting in Wellington on Sunday night, we wait till one o'clock in the morning as a ferry. We get home at four or five in the morning. And so we're so tired. I got home and someone rang me up. Barry, yes. <clears throat> he says, would you come to Blenheim? He said, my, one of my relations is dying. He needs help. And I thought, oh, just after midnight, I said, please help me. And my wife said, come on, let's go. Do you know, it's not good for men to live alone. Because <laughs> he goes to bed when he wants to. <laughs> come on, put your clothes on. I said, all right then. Put the clothes on, 40 miles to town. We get in there and there's this old man lying in bed. Never been to church in his life. Lovely guy, a fisherman who had no time for religion, no time for God, no time for church. He's lying in bed. I knew he was dying. And his son came in, and I'd heard his wife was very antagonistic. I was a bit nervous of her, because the Bible says, be careful of a brawling woman. Is that right? <laughs> says, it's better to dwell on the corner of a housetop than in a wide house with a brawling woman. Says that. And I knew she really didn't like Christians at all, so I thought, oh dear. 
So I went into this room and I said to this man, oh, look, I says, Jim, you're not very well. I didn't want to say he was dying. That doesn't go down well. You know. You're not very well at the moment. I says, uh, you need to accept Christ. I explained it to him. I said, Jim, here's the sinner's prayer. I've come all the way from Polaris. I've got my birth certificates with me. I carry these with me everywhere so I can help people. There it is. Anybody who comes to the front tonight, you'll get one of these. We'll write the time and the date, and you'll sign the thing when you receive Jesus as your Savior. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. I know you're all born of the flesh. We must be born of the Spirit. If you've never been born of the Spirit, people out in the overflow, you come in here. People up in the balcony, you come here. All over the meeting, you come here and do it of your own free will. Nobody drag anybody, please. It's got to be of your own free will. I'm on my way to hell. I'm not saved. I want to receive Christ and you'll be saved by the grace of God. Jesus put it this way. Matthew 10, 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men. Here's a good spot to do it. Him also will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, just stay where you are, him also will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. It's like getting married. You must do it in front of people. Never get married in the back seat. You agree with that? You're always out here. This is where you do it. It's a covenant, you see. So anyway, so I said, Lord, why do people go to hell for receiving the mark? He said, because, because the head is reserved for the name of Jesus. And here's this dear old man lying in bed, almost gone. I said, Jim, are you ready to pray the prayer? And you know, he said, yes. I got a shock. Most people say no. <laughs> okay, Jim, follow me. And I said to his son, are you ready? A man of about 30 years of age. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, follow me. So we prayed this prayer together. I come to the cross as a sinner. I repent, I believe, and I receive Christ. His blood is enough. And I just paused at the end of the prayer, and I just opened my eyes and looked, and I saw tears trickling down his face. This dear old fella. And then I said, sit up, Jim, look at me. And he looked at me, and his eyes were clear, clear as crystal. And I said, here's your card, Jim. Are you strong enough to sign this? He said, yes. So I gave him a pen. I put a piece of book behind it, an old magazine or something. He signed the card, signed his name. I received Jesus as my saviour. Now I said, go and get his wife. This is the frightening part. <laughs> you know, she came into the room. She never looked at me. She looked right past me. She looked at her husband. She said, what's happened, love? And he spoke clearly. I've never heard anything like this before. He said, I've just been accepted into the family of God. I didn't tell him that. The Spirit of God told him that. And he was so excited. And she threw herself across the bed. She landed right on him and hugged him. She said, that's wonderful, darling. Do you know he died the next day? Just got in by the skin of his teeth. And about three months later, his dear old wife came to our little church. We have a church at a place called Canvas Town. It's an old gold mining town where they used to live in tents. We we're in a public hall. About 60 people gather there on Sundays. And she came out to the meeting. When I gave the invite, she came straight to the front and received Christ. And now she's going to heaven also to be with Jesus. And she'll be with her husband forever. Will the circle be unbroken, we used to sing? Fathers and mothers and children all need to be in the family. You've got to get yourself in first and then get the rest of the family. You pray them in. We're going to sing a hymn, everybody. Don't leave the meeting at this point, please. Just give the people five minutes to make a choice, would you? Those of you out the back, I want you to come in here and receive Christ tonight. You say, do I have to do it in front? Yes. Where did you get married? Up the front or up the back? Answer, in the front. This is where you receive Christ. Do not ask me to pray with you in the vestibule afterwards, please. That is like getting married after the wedding. <laughs> this is where we do it, in front of the people, and you're going to receive Christ as your Savior tonight. I'm going to call the musicians. We'll sing our song, which is called Amazing Grace. We sang it once. We'll sing it again. And I want you to come, young and old, single and married, husbands and wives, children, you make your way to Christ. Let me pray now in Jesus' name. Just bow your heads, dear ones, please. <clears throat> Just bow your heads, please. Father in heaven, Father in heaven, this is a special moment in the lives of people who need to make a choice. Give them strength. Get their legs walking, I pray, Lord. Help the fathers and the mothers and the young folks to receive Christ now and be born again in Jesus' name. I bind up any power that would hold them back and I set you free in the name of Jesus. Every spiritual force of masonry or anything else, you'll leave them alone and they are now free to receive Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our song, Amazing Grace. And as we do, you come. Come with a friend. Come by yourself and give your life to Jesus. Let's stand, shall we? Let's sing it now. <clears throat>
come we'll only have one verse to do it on because we close the meeting after this verse unless I see the people start to come it is a privilege to receive Jesus never think we're doing God a favor by getting saved some of you say I can't get out yes you can people will move as you make your way to Jesus some say I'm a bit nervous turn to the person next to you and somebody will come with you as you give your life to Jesus tonight this is the night of salvation and God will bless you as you come in Jesus name help them Lord I pray in Jesus name Amen. God bless. Twas grace. All together. Twas grace that friends thank you very much thank you very much for listening tonight god bless you tomorrow night i'm going to speak on the uh why there is a pyramid on the back of the dollar i'm going to speak on the twin towers in prophecy and things like that you will really enjoy i promise you if you well, should have come forward tonight you ask the lord you say lord tomorrow night give me strength to get out the front here and make a clear choice for jesus god bless you very much pastor thank you so much indeed bless you Right, we just have to be mindful of those people that are double parked and triple parked. So if you'd like to leave first, and please follow the instructions of the attendants and they'll help you get out quickly and speedily. We appreciate you coming. And we are again tomorrow night at 7.30, so please come early for a seat. You'll get up the front you'll, where the glory comes out. You'll have a great time. Okay, you're dismissed. God bless you. And bring along your friends, those that need Jesus. They all need Jesus. Praise God. Thank you very much. Good night.